Good morning and welcome. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the City's Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. It's good to be back at City Hall. After a year and a half of making the most of Zoom hearings and re working remotely, I'm glad to be here with my colleagues, Ben Kalos, uh, 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 Barry Gudenchik, Margaret Chin, Fernando Cabrera, and Vanessa Gibson. Oh, shit. Hey, Farah, good morning. <clears throat> and also to be joined by the public. I certainly do not take lightly the seriousness of COVID-19 pandemic and all the efforts the city has taken through now to contain the spread of the virus and keep everyone safe and healthy. And it's for that reason I don't take for granted our ability to be back in person today. Gathering today is an integral way we remain civically engaged and I'm thankful to be here. Today, the committee will be hearing 13 different bills, some related to construction safety, some related to gas piping inspections, and several more within the purview of the committee. I will introduce each bill in turn. First, intro 2309, sponsored by Council Member Kalos, will require applicants seeking to rent out short-term rentals for fewer than 30 days, 30 consecutive days to re register annually with the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement and obtain a registration number before doing so. Next, we have a number of bills related to construction safety. Intro number 2262, sponsored by myself, would streamline the sign-off process for permits issued in connection with temporary construction equipment by no longer requiring certain final inspections for such equipment, and would also prohibit the installation and use of standoff brackets, which DOB has identified as a contributing factor in suspending scaffolding incidents. Intro number 2263, also sponsored by me, would amend the definition of major building construction site to now include buildings that are seven or more stories or 75 feet or more in height. This change would trigger additional site safety requirements for more construction sites. Intro number 2264, also sponsored by me, would establish new requirements for the installation of coal form steel light frame construction and establish new special inspection requirements for the use of coal form steel light frame construction. Intro number 2276, sponsored by Council Member Moya, will require additional safety su supervision of major building construction sites to build on efforts to reduce construction-related injuries and fatalities. Proto proposed intro number 2278A, sponsored by Public Advocate Williams, will require general contractors to be licensed by DOB in a similar manner to how other trades are licensed under DOB and will prohibit any person from performing general contracting work unless approved by DOB. Next, we'll be hearing a number of bills related to Local Law 152 and gas piping inspections, all of which are sponsored by me. Intro number 2259 would extend the December 31st, 2021 inspection deadline for buildings in community districts 2, 5, 7, 13, and 18 in all boroughs until June 30th, 2022, and also require DOP, DOB to conduct targeted outreach regarding compliance with the requirements of Local Law 152. Intro number 2321 will, cre will create a hardship program for inspection and correction of gas piping systems in buildings. The hardship program would allow a building owner who was unable to comply with an inspection due date to defer for 90 days. Intro number 2361 will require DOB to create a questionnaire to seek feedback on Local Law 152. DOB would be required to report to the council, the mayor, and post on its website the results of the questionnaires received during the period calendar year annually starting March 2022. Intro number 2377 would extend the physical scope of inspection from individual tenant spaces to the point of connection for an equipment that uses gas supply by gas piping. Additionally, we'll hear the following legislation. Preconsidered intro, uh, hasn't been numbered yet, sponsored by Council Member Lander, would take the certification of no harassment pilot created by Local Law 1 of 2018 and extend it until September 27, 2026. Intro number 1817, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, would require the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to promulgate certain minimum rules governing affordable housing lotteries. 
And finally, intro number 2265, also sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, would amend the housing maintenance code by requiring owners of units in multiple dwellings to provide tenants with the option of either permanent st stove safety knobs with integrated locking mechanisms or stove knob covers for each knob located on the front of each gas powered stove. I look forward to hearing testimony related to these bills from the Department of Buildings, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement, industry experts, and interested members of the public. Because of the number of bills, and in order to most efficiently utilize everyone's time, we'll dedicate the, force, the first portion of the hearing to intro number 2309, and we'll hear testimony from OSE and conduct question and answer with them first. We will then move to HPD, and the OB portion of the hearing on the remaining legislation. Before we move to testimony from OSE, I'd like to remind all members of the public who would like to testify today to please fill out a card with the sergeant. In the interest of time, we will be sticking to a two minute clock for all public testimony. And now I'll turn it over to committee counsel, Audrey Sun, to administer the oath of administration before their testimony. I'm sorry, I've been instructed that we will hear from uh, one of the sp bill sponsors and good friend, Ben Kalos. Thank you to uh, the Chair of Housing and Buildings and my good friend, uh, Robert Cornegy. Council Member Ben Kalos, sponsor of Introduction 2309, and I've been working on this for eight years. I've been a tenant most of my life, and I'm tired of having to compete with tourists for housing in this city. Housing should be for New Yorkers. Hotels should be for tourists. It's that simple. What's worse, as a renter, every renter and I had to pay an extra $384 more in increased rent due to Airbnb's expansion from 2015 to 2017. This spike in rent actually forced me and my wife to move during a high-risk pregnancy. I didn't know where the spike in rent came from until today. There were 37,000 units on Airbnb in February and half of them listed entire homes, which is not allowed in buildings with three or more units under state law. Short-term rentals are restricted to less than 30 days where the resident is home at the time under that same state law. There are many bad actors out there, like one who rented apartments to tens of thousands of guests, over 55,441 nights, over three years across 35 different buildings, which the city thankfully caught. But just to put that in perspective, that is 151 years of housing that was kept off the market. Now, it's possible that many hosts don't even know that what they're doing is illegal. Today, we're hearing legislation to require every host and every platform to register their units. Through the registration process, hosts will learn whether it is legal to rent their units. Units that are rent regulated and in NYCHA public housing won't be allowed. Market rate rentals would be able to register and list their units with their landlord's permission. Cooperatives and condominiums owners will be able to register and list their units. I might add that cooperatives on the Upper East Side do not usually permit rentals. I actually live in a cooperative that does. Uh, though where they do, boards could always adopt new house rules. Single-family homeowners would be free to register and list spare rooms or any habitable sleeping accommodation. Now, with the recent flooding and deaths from Ida, it's important to me that the spaces be inspected before they are rented to unsuspecting tourists. When we pass this legislation, New York City's affordable housing crisis might get a little bit easier with a flood of 18,000 apartments coming back on the market many of which might even be affordable. This morning, we had 45,131 people in our shelters. 14,616 of them were children, 11,021 were adults as part of 8,387 families. We could end family homelessness with just half the units that are coming back. With only 16,188 single adults in our shelter system, we could house every homeless New Yorker in these soon to be vacant units. We have to be, um, Housing is a human right, and by working to make sure there's more of it available in New York City, we're making a real difference. I want to take a moment to thank Michael McKee and Tenants Pack, uh, Tom Kaler and Murray Cox, as well as Inside Airbnb, uh, the Coalition Against Illegal Hotels and its working group, Assemblymember Dick Gottfried, my counsel, Wilfredo Lopez, 
who had the misfortune of living in a rental building surrounded by short-term rentals uh, where the constant coming and going of people actually forced him out of his home. And of course, to my friend, colleague, and uh, chair of Housing and Buildings, Robert Carnegie. Thank you, and now is the time to bring these units back onto the market and make it safe for every New Yorker. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kalos, and now I'll turn it over to Committee Council uh, Audrey Sun to administer the oath to the administration before their testimony. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin when ready. Good morning, Chairperson Cornegy, members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and Council Member Kalos. My name is Christian Clergy. I am the Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement, which is overseen. All right, I'll go again since it's being recorded. Is this thing on? Just kidding. Good morning, Chairperson Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings and Council Member Kalos. My name is Christian Klosner. I am the Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement, which is overseen by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. OSC's mandate, originating, originating from a mayoral executive order in 2006, is to coordinate efforts across city agencies to problem solve around emerging issues adversely affecting neighborhood cohesion, livability, and safety. The vast majority of OSC's work since 2015 has related to addressing illegal short-term rentals occurring in the city's permanent residential housing stock. Because this testimony will reference illegal short-term rentals repeatedly, let me state for the record what the current law is in New York City. The city and state laws that apply in New York City restrict rentals for fewer than 30 consecutive days to only those situations where up to two guests are maintaining a common household with the permanent occupant of the housing unit, whether in a multiple dwelling or in a one or two family building. Entire home rentals and rentals to more than two guests are illegal. Living in one unit of a building while renting another unit to guests does not constitute a hosted rental. By working to stop the proliferation of these illegal short-term rentals, OSC's enforcement efforts advance key goals of this administration to help preserve affordability and community livability, to prevent harassment and displacement of permanent residents, and to increase access to permanent housing. Our enforcement efforts protect residents and visitors to New York City from dangerous violations of the city's building and fire safety standards while striving to ensure that New Yorkers are not disturbed by illegal commercial activity in their residential neighborhoods and buildings. <coughs> As OSC has reported in the last five years worth of annual reports submitted to council pursuant to local law, between 2016 and 2020, OSC has received over 11,800 complaints about illegal short-term rentals, conducted more than 21,000 inspections, and issued just under 13,000 violations that have resulted in the imposition of $37 million in fines, approximately. This field activity, driven and informed by both the complaints of tenants and neighbors throughout New York City and the data analysis of OSC's research team, has resulted in thousands of illegal rentals being addressed. In select instances of illegal activity persisting in buildings, or where OSC research and investigations reveal operations that span multiple, sometimes dozens of buildings, our legal team initiates litigation. OSC has brought 20 lawsuits since 2015, addressing a wide range of illegal short-term rental operations and resulting in court protections for the housing as well as $4.7 million in settlements and penalties assessed against the operators of short-term rentals and the building owners that allow their buildings to be misused. This work has not only directly impacted thousands of illegal operators and enhanced the livability of buildings and neighborhoods throughout the city, but it has exposed several key truths about the short-term rental market. One, the chief tool of the illegal short-term rental operator is the online marketplace created by the booking services. Two, 
Only through obtaining data from the online booking services can the full extent of an illegal operation be understood. Three, there are few restraints imposed by the booking services to stop the proliferation of illegal activity. And four, lack of verification of host identities and addresses of listings, coupled with reluctance by platforms to ban facially illegal activity, have directly contributed to the rise of the illegal short-term rental market in New York City. Sadly, it took the worst public health crisis in memory to significantly disrupt the thousands of illegal rentals occurring on a nightly basis in New York City. With illegal short-term rental activity declining significantly during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. This disruption was further enhanced with the council's enactment and the mayor's uh, signing of Local Laws 146 of 2018 and Local Law 64 of 2020, collectively known as the city's booking service data reporting law, which went into effect this past January. The law had an immediate impact, resulting in a significant drop in the total number of illegal short-term rental listings. For example, on Airbnb, these illegal listings dropped from approximately 38,000 in October 2020 to approximately 14,000 in August 2021. Unfortunately, illegal short-term rental activity in New York City is now rebounding. In the first quarter of 2021, across the several platforms reporting data to the city, there were approximately 3,600 illegal listings with high intensity use covered by the reporting law, booked for a total of 135,000 nights. The average listing was booked for 32 nights in the reporting period, excluding outliers. The second quarter saw a significant increase in the number of illegal listings, up 33% to over approximately 4,800. But the intensification of illegal activity was even more pronounced with the total number of nights booked increasing by 65% to roughly 223,000. The mean nights booked for listings leapt from 34 to 46 nights for the quarter. As we have seen for the past several years, this illegal activity is most rampant in areas of the city that have faced significant gentrification in the past two decades, including Williamsburg and Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, and Chelsea, Chinatown, the Lower East Side, and the East Village in Manhattan. I should point out that these observations do not include activity happening in listings that may appear on their face to be legal and therefore are not required to be reported pursuant to the reporting law. Broadly speaking, the reporting law only requires reporting on facially, facially illegal listings, those that offer an entire unit or occupancy for three or more guests. There is a segment of the illegal short-term rental market that is facilitated through listings that appear to be for a partial unit and only one or two guests, but may still be illegal, for example, when several such listings are for rooms in the same unit, or when such rooms occur in multiple locations but are offered by the same host. Taken in combination, these unreported listings reflect de facto illegal hostels, and we estimate that in the last quarter, there were 2,400 listings indicating this type of illegal activity, which is heavily concentrated in the neighborhoods of Bushwick, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Harlem, and Hell's Kitchen. This and other data received from platforms combined with our enforcement to reveal one more key truth. The way to address the inherent challenges of scaling inspection-based enforcement is to add prevention to the cure and support it with a robust registration framework where unpermitted activity is not allowed onto the marketplaces online. Thus, OSE supports the intent of intro 2309 to provide a registration system for short-term rentals that comply with existing laws and the tools to prevent unregistered activity from flourishing in a largely unregulated online marketplace. OSE looks forward to working with council to suggest changes based on our expertise so that the focus remains on preventing transactions that are illegal with enforcement resources directed at the marketplace that drives the extent of the activity, not just the individual actors. This concludes my testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to provide it, and I welcome any questions you have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I will be asking a few questions before I pass uh, to my colleagues who are present. Um, the first question I have is you mentioned in your testimony that there is an increase in illegal use uh, up, significant, up significantly as of recent. You cited that perhaps 
uh, a portion of it in highly gentrifying areas was gentrification as a, as a, you know, as a, as a construct. Uh, I'm also wondering what your thoughts are on uh, the pandemic, the rent moratorium, and those types of things. Also, are, uh, would you consider those to be mitigating factors um, at, at this time from your estimation? Um, you know, we're looking closely at the timing of things, and so when we talk about the drop in listings, it was right at the time where the law passed, Airbnb started implementing their, um, their user education and announcing what was going to happen, that we saw that significant drop. In terms of the numbers that we reported from the first quarter to the second quarter, um, that, is, uh, that is a combination of all the activity that is being reported um, so obviously not all the activity that's occurring on the sites, and not even, as I pointed out, all the illegal activity, but all of the entire units and all of the listings for three or more, um, and we're seeing it rebound quickly. Um, I don't have any, uh, any data or evidence to weigh in on um, the question about the rent moratorium, and I forgive, forgive me, you mentioned another factor uh, that you were asking for my opinion on. No, I, I said uh, the... The rent moratorium, in, it, largely the rent moratorium and the pandemic um, as being potential for mitigating factors for the increase of uh, families finding themselves in uh, uh, deep financial worry. Uh, uh, would you, I, 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 if would any you, of those two factors? So these numbers reflect simply the nights being booked of people coming to the city and booking short term rentals. I, I say coming to the city, people just booking short term rentals. So it's purely transactional. Um, the amount of activity that's happening and being reported to the city. I don't think we could discern out um, anything to weigh in on those factors. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, then my first question as it relates directly to this is, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to um, how the Office of Special Enforcement learns about illegal short-term rentals. What is the, what is the reporting mechanism for, for finding or locating the, you know, a potential illegal operator? Uh, sure, there are two sources. Um, one, obviously, we receive complaints. Um, uh, as Councilmember Kalos mentioned, uh, as staff person lived surrounded by short-term rentals, we get complaints from folks like that all the time that report a loss of safety, a degradation in the quality of life in the building, increased noise, um, and all kinds of nuisance-like behaviors. Uh, we get those complaints throughout the city, not just a neighbor in a building, but also a neighbor down the block. Um, we. Uh, in addition to complaints, we also do proactive inspections where we use uh, scraped data from inside Airbnb to identify folks that are engaging in near constant illegal activity. Um, and when we receive data from the platforms, for instance, through subpoenas or now from the reporting law, we turn that into enforcement actions as well. Uh, thank you. So do, do any short-term rental booking platforms share data directly with OSE, or do you have to get it from a third party, or? Uh, they are all now under the city's reporting law. Uh, I, I shouldn't say all. The major ones are reporting data to the city for the categories that the reporting law requires. In addition, um, booking services have been cooperative with the city's subpoenas and provided data that's been demanded pursuant to those subpoenas. I don't know if complying with a subpoena means being compliant, but okay. Um, but what kind are, of what kind of data? I'm just saying separate from the reporting law. So the reporting law has uh, a number of points, and um, we could certainly refer back to those. But um, it's also on our on our website under the reporting law tab. Um, lots of specific points about the location of the address, who the host is, what their contact information is, the, uh, nights booked, the um, amount of revenue generated, and um, and those are now coming on a quarterly basis. In addition, we still have a subpoena practice. Um, we were using that before the reporting law to get data, um, and we are continuing to use that, especially if we need to take a deeper dive beyond a reporting quarter to look at the historic impact of a particular operator. So, so um, what is the, as it relates to OSC, what is the specific data that is shared? Um, I, I would love to provide you a very specific written answer to that question follow, following the hearing. Okay, so we will follow up yep. for that. Uh, how does OSC issue violations against owners or operators of short-term rentals that are rented using a booking platform? Um, 
the violations that we issue are, are um, the first violation is a violation for the illegal conversion of a permanent residential unit into a short-term rental. Um, there are there are two different statutes in the building code. Um, in general, it is a occupancy contrary to what is permitted, um, and so a violation is issued under the building code. Um, that's been on the books for decades. In the um, approximately a decade ago, when the state updated the multiple dwellings law and clarified the law, um, the city council then responded with local law 45, which created an enhanced set of penalties for multiple dwellings, especially where there was a second offense or multiple units being rented. But in either case, the core violation is for the change of permanent residential occupancy to an illegal short-term rental occupancy. In addition, there are violations issued for lacking the safety provisions required when you have transient use, such as adequate fire alarms, adequate sprinklers, and adequate egress. Um, finally, um, and the uh, and the one, and, and all of those violations are independent of whether the person is using a booking platform or not. The, the use of the booking platform becomes relevant when the person is advertising illegal occupancy in a multiple dwelling, and then we have the advertising law that the state passed banning illegal advertisements of Class A multiple dwellings. Um, that is the one section of our enforcement law that only applies to multiple dwellings. That doesn't apply to one and two, although the change in occupancy does. Do you happen to have the number of violations, oh, I'm sorry, the number of uh, owners who've received violations uh, over the last two, year, two calendar years? Um, I can say broadly that in 2020, we issued 1,527 violations. In 2019, we issued 3,565 violations. Um, there is on our website, if you go to about, and we'll certainly make sure that you have copies of these that were submitted to council, uh, in about, there's um, a data page that lists our annual reports, and in those annual reports is actually a tab that lists out, disaggregated by council district, all of the violations that are issued, including who they're issued to, what the status is. But I, I'll make a note to send those reports to you as well. So when OSC inspects short-term rentals, does it also look for violations of the building code and the housing maintenance code? So in addition to just, you know, the office, you know, your interest as it relates to uh, violations of the statute that are directly correlated to um, short-term rentals, do you also cast a wider net, I guess for a better use of language, uh, on, on a building? Yeah, I mean, to, to be clear, all of the violations that we write are referenced in the city's administrative code um, through provisions of the building code and that incorporate the definitions and restrictions of the housing maintenance code. But if I understand your question, do we also write for a crumbling facade if we see it, or do we write for blocked egress? Um, and the answer is yes. The inspectors on our team from the Department of Buildings and the Fire Department, if they see a condition, they're required to take the appropriate action. So I guess um, I thought I heard in your testimony, but for the record, does OSC support uh, intro number 2309? OSC supports the goal of 2309. Um, as with all legislation, we, um, we're committed to working with council to make sure that the, the best result comes down. Um, but it is clear that we need the tool of an online registration system that will allow us to go to the booking services and make them remove all of the unpermitted and unregistered activity. It's the marketplaces where this illegal activity is flourishing and this will give us the new tool to prevent um, and uh, get into prevention before we even get to inspection and enforcement at a home. So overall, you agree with the bill? Overall, we agree with the idea that there needs to be a tool to get illegal activity off of the sites, and this is a step in the right direction. I was hoping you wouldn't make me dig deeper. So are there any major concerns with the bill that you'd like to cite here this morning? Uh, okay. There's no major concerns I'd like to cite here. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to uh, questions from our colleagues. I would ask that you keep those questions to three minutes in the interest of time because we have a full agenda today, and we're starting with Councilmember Kalos, I'm sorry. 
thank you, and thank you for the additional time to ask the questions. Uh, Christian, uh, <coughs> I want to thank you for your uh, work, your testimony. The, the, the numbers are staggering that you uh, just reported. You're telling me just in one quarter, uh, I did the math, I divided the number of illegal nights in the last quarter, uh, the 135,000 nights by 365, and I came out with 369 years of housing that's been taken off the market. Is that correct? I, I trust your calculator, council member. It, it, it's, uh, that, that's just uh, jaw dropping. Uh, introduction 2309 is silent as to what units can be rented because that is dictated by state law. Uh, in your testimony, you said laws, quote, restrict rentals for fewer than 30 days to only those situations where up to two guests are maintaining a common household. With the permanent occupant of the building, sorry, of the housing unit, whether in a multiple dwelling or in a one or two family building, entire home rentals and rentals to more than two guests are illegal. Living in one unit of building while renting another to guests does not constitute a hosted rental. Uh, can you share, is there a specific case law uh, that supports your interpretation or specific state law that supports uh, your interpretation? Uh, sure, and, I, and to be clear, it is not just state law, right? This has been illegal in city law for decades since we've had a building code. You have not been allowed to change the use from one approved use to one use that is not approved. Changing from permanent housing to transient housing constitutes such a conversion um, and ample case law on that point. The, the source of the restrictions comes from the building code occupancy classifications, which classify residential units, now R2 and R3, formerly J2 and J3, as for permanent residential purposes only. The state law clarifies what permanent residential purposes is, consecutive use for 30 days, um, and informs that those city laws. Um, the, uh, in addition, the source of what causes the legal short-term rental, which is the hosted for two guests, is that permanent, permanent occupancy of a, of a residential unit is for a family and the housing maintenance, code, housing maintenance code definition of family includes up to two roomers, boarders, or lodgers. And so it's that definition that creates a very small exception for what is a legal short-term rental. If somebody is interested in converting a current residential use for transient use, uh, is there a process to do so? Uh, there is, through the Department of Buildings. That's my time, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Thank you so much for your testimony. We are now going to hear testimony from DOB and HPD. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, and I, um, I do wanna say for the record before I go that although I'll be walking out, I will be reviewing uh, all of the testimony before. I, I know there are a number of people here to testify in 2309. Um, from a, a range of opinions, and I look forward to hearing what they have to say to inform us as we uh, close the loop on this piece of legislation. Uh, thank you so much for your commitment to stay and listen. It's very important that uh, not only our ears, but OSE gets to hear directly from those uh, members of the public yep. who have voiced their opinion to our individual offices and to this body. So thank you for that commitment to stay. Great. Well, not to stay. I am going to leave, but I am going to listen to the entire thing. Well, is I, there someone Once that, I get back to the office. I'm sorry, uh, I believe that uh, Mar uh, Margaret Chin, before you leave, also has a question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, yeah, I, I just had a, a question, Director. Uh, first of all, I really wanted to thank uh, the Special Enforcement Unit on the recent victory. And there were a couple of buildings in my district, and there were tenants who's been complaining about their landlord, you know, illegally uh, um, renting out Airbnb, and it really took a lot of effort uh, to finally get some results. So I think with this bill, uh, with my colleague, Councilmember Kalos, I hope that it would encourage more proactive uh, enforcement in terms of if you have the registration, is there ways that you can check together with HPD uh, to see whether some of these buildings, uh, whether units are registered or rent stabilized building? And I think that a more proactive approach would also help you know, mitigate some of the harassment and the tenants are suffering 
uh, because of this Airbnb? Uh, the, um, it's a complicated question. Uh, let me break down the easy parts. We, uh, we do have access to unit information about stabilization, but only through subpoenas to DHCR. Um, HBD obviously has that data, but um, has very strong restrictions on their, uh, their understanding with the state about the use of that data, so we can't simply share unit data um, from them. But again, the, you know, my understanding of the goal of the legislation and the thing that OSC supports is that if it isn't legal for them to do, they would never make it onto the website. They, they might have a listing, but it wouldn't be registered and the platforms would be penalized for processing transactions from those listings. And so the value of a registration system and the, the hope and the goal is that it simply prevents all of that illegal activity right from the get-go and makes it so people can't enter the market illegally. Well, we'll look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, thank you, Chair. As with you. Thank you, Council Member, thank you, Chair. Thank you. So we'll, we'll now ask uh, for HPD and DOB. Somebody grab them, please. I think they're right outside. So I'm gonna ask uh, committee council to please swear in DOB and uh, HPD. It's just DOB, I'm sorry, it's just HPD and Chair Okay, please, we'll, we'll begin, um, we're, we're uh, waiting for a uh, Commissioner LaRocca to come from DOB, but HPD, if you could please begin your testimony. I mean, if you could just uh, be sworn in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie and members of the New York City Council Committee of Housing and Buildings. My name is Anne Marie Santiago, and I am the Deputy Commissioner of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important and timely conversation on Local Law 1 of 2018 and the status of the certification of no harassment pilot. The CONH pilot is one of the many unprecedented steps that the city has taken in partnership with the council to combat tenant harassment and displacement. There is no silver, silver bullet to address the difficult issue of harassment in all its many forms, which is why this administration has adopted a range of new programs while using existing tools more aggressively to support tenants and address harassment through proactive inspections, targeted litigation, and improved coordination of interagency efforts. Those efforts are more important than ever in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, which has made access to stable, affordable housing all the more critical. We very much look forward to continuing our work with the Council to ensure we have the tools we need to protect New Yorkers who continue to face significant instability and to support an equitable recovery. Local 01 grew out of the Certification of No Harassment Working Group, convened in 2016 by Council Member Brad Lander and then HPD Commissioner Vicki Bean to respond to concerns of increased tenant harassment and displacement across the city. The working group, with, which included city council members, tenant advocates, and representatives from government agencies and the real estate industry, was charged with identifying building characteristics that might indicate harassment and exploring ways to further deter harassment through the longstanding anti-displacement CONH program. After considering many factors and performing a number of data analyses, the city introduced the CONH pilot modeled after the successful program employed by the city to deter harassment in single room occupancy buildings citywide 
and multiple dwellings in anti-harassment zones of special zoning districts. The CONH program seeks to disincentivize property owners from harassing tenants to vacate their homes by conditioning future building permits to convert or demolish the building on proof that no tenants were harassed during the prescribed period of time. The pilot created a limited expansion in time and scope of the broader CONH program, which has become an effective anti-displacement tool to deter tenant harassment. The CONH requirement is a relatively narrow tool that is triggered only when the property owner whose building is subject to the program seeks uh, permit applications for specific types of work. Therefore, the program functions best when it is precisely tailored to target buildings with the potential for harassment and communities identified to have a high risk because of existing housing quality issues or concerns about displacement pressures. Local Law 1 of 2018, which establishes the pilot, set forth criteria based on the findings of the working group to specifically target buildings in which tenants may be at risk of harassment, largely based on the building size, its physical location uh, conditions, and its location. Since introduction, HPD has focused on both the implementation and oversight of the pilot, including the promulgation of rules, coordination across agencies, hiring of staff, regular meetings with advocates to discuss the program, and for feedback from tenants living in pilot buildings, the issuance of a request for proposal for community groups to assist with the agency's investigation of the CONH applications, the education and training of new and existing HPD attorneys and investigators, and the creation of an online portal for the submission of all CONH applications. Among the requirements of the law is that the city determine whether the pilot reduces harassment in order to inform the council's next steps regarding the direction of the program. While three years is a relatively short period of time with which, within which to measure impacts on owner behavior, the analysis has been further complicated by two major events that significantly impacted the house, city's housing market. The first was the passage of the New York State Legislature, the first was the passage by the New York State Legislature of the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019, which sought to reduce owners' incentives to encourage turnover through harassment of rent-stabilized tenants in order to access rent increases. The second, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted in significant construction delays and constrained many building owners' ability to perform even routine maintenance. These factors likely contributed to the city receiving fewer CONH applications for buildings in the pilot than expected and, and affected overall owner behavior. Construction permits for all type of work were down 34% citywide during this period. Recognizing these challenges, the city used available data and a review of qualitative feedback to produce preliminary findings. HPD violation data indicates that buildings subject to the expanded CONH requirement have a higher decrease in the number of HPD violations than buildings citywide, a positive trend that may suggest the CONH requirement is disincentivizing harassment among owners of program buildings. However, additional data is necessary to fully evaluate the overall effectiveness of the pilot and to ensure that it is structured in a way that meets its intended purpose. Given the evaluation was based on findings limited by the short time period and complicating external factors, the city recommends the continuation of the pilot upon its expiration this month in order to evaluate a complete five-year pilot cycle. We are developing specific amendments to recommend if the pilot was to be extended to better focus the criteria and reduce the potential for any unintended harm to tenants. The city believes the CONH requirement is an important initiative in the city's diverse range of anti-harassment tools to protect tenants. We are supportive of the goal to extend the pilot program and look forward to working with the council on the most effective and efficient way to continue the CONH pilot and further deter harassment. Now to speak on intro 1817. Intro 1817 would require HPD to promulgate certain minimum rules for governing affordable housing lotteries. HPD's current marketing policies go beyond those described in the bill. We absolutely agree that it is essential that applicants to affordable housing opportunities have a clear understanding of both where they stand in the marketing process and their ability to appeal eligibility determinations they feel were made in error. Since the date this bill was originally introduced in 2019, the agency has made significant revisions to our marketing handbook, and in July 2020 rolled out a years in the making new and robust housing portal called Housing Connect 2.0. Housing Connect 2.0 was designed with continued feedback from applicants, community groups, elected officials, 
HPD staff, marketing agents, and our development partners. And we are continuing to adjust planned enhancements to Housing Connect based on feedback from these partners. We do have concerns with intro 1817. We want to ensure that a new local, state, or federal government requirements are implemented or significant changes emerge, such as those we've seen in the wake of COVID-19, we have the ability to respond nimbly in updating our marketing guidelines. In addition, the new portal allows applicants the flexibility to choose between a paper or digital notification system. The cost of complying with the written notice requirements would be significant for the agency, as well as our partners, while also creating logistical uh, problems and reduced options for tenants. HPD shares the goal of ensuring that the marketing, lease-up, and sales effort process is fair and provides equal opportunity to all applicants. And we look forward to having more discussions with the Council and all of our partners on finding ways to put in place policies that are more inclusive and further reduce barriers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. I see that we've been joined by our Commissioner LaRocco. If you please join us uh, and uh, allow committee council to swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Uh, wait, Commissioner, before you begin, I also want to state for the record that we've been joined by uh, my colleague, Council, Councilwoman Inez Barron. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Carnegie, members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss construction safety, an issue of utmost importance to the department, as well as periodic gas piping system inspections, which are required by Local Law 152 of 2016. Construction-related injuries and fatalities on job sites throughout New York City are a painful reminder that more needs to be done to improve the safety of construction. I firmly believe that we, the department, the city council, and the construction industry can work together to prevent avoidable injuries and fatalities. Construction workers who are critical to the economic growth of this city and who are working on the tens of thousands of active construction sites throughout the city as we speak must be able to go home to their families at the end of their shift. While the number of construction-related fatalities decreased for the first time in half a decade last year, there have been 75 construction-related fatalities since 2015. This is an unacceptable this is unacceptable, and we must work together to do more to improve safety at construction sites. Before I continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank our construction workers for the critical work that they do, and to remember the workers who lost their lives building this city up, including the workers that have lost their lives this year alone. Dave Bottinelli during an alteration of an existing 25-story building in Midtown Manhattan. Henri Cristo Dimo during the construction of a single-family home in Pleasant Plains, Staten Island. Elian Seeley during the construction of a 26-story building in Chelsea, Manhattan. Juan Rez during facade repairs at a six-story building in Flatlands, Brooklyn. Mauricio Sanchez, when an elevator dropped during, an alt during the alteration of a five-story building in Mott Haven, Bronx. Diego Ligojota, during the alteration of a six-story building in Long Island City, Queens. And finally, Jose Hernandez, during the demolition of a two-story building in Flatbush, Brooklyn. In 2019, for the first time in nearly a decade, construction-related injuries decreased. Last year, we saw another decrease in construction-related injuries, with 502 construction-related injuries in 2020, down 34% from the 761 construction-related injuries in 2018. 
While there was a decrease in construction-related injuries in 2020 for a second year in a row, it should be noted that the construction industry was impacted by COVID-19, including a pause on all non-essential construction, which resulted in a decrease in construction activity during that year. As New York City recovers from COVID-19 and the construction industry gets back to work, we must continue to prioritize safety. The decrease in injuries since 2018 comes after the launch of our Construction Safety Compliance Unit, which is dedicated to conducting proactive, unannounced inspections of large construction sites. To date, the CSC unit has conducted nearly 65,000 proactive inspections at over 25,000 unique sites. The decrease in injuries also comes after a multi-year implementation of Local Law 196 of 2017, which requires workers on many of our larger sites to receive comprehensive site safety training. As of earlier this year, workers at large construction sites are required to have 40 hours of safety training, and supervisors at those sites are required to have 62 hours of safety training, including fall prevention training. Since the enactment of this law, the department has conducted extensive outreach to the construction industry, including proactive visits to construction sites across the city to directly inform workers who are impacted. Informing workers of this safety training requirement while keeping the industry informed of upcoming deadlines and a way to obtain the training. Additional outreach and education efforts have included online worker safety sessions, in-person information sessions with stakeholders in the construction industry, multilingual advertisements in dozens of community papers, and system-wide system, um, system -wide subway ad campaign, direct worker outreach at worker sites, at work sites by DOB construction inspectors and staff from the department's community engagement unit, as well as direct mailings to all DOB licensed safety professionals and permit holders whose work requires Local Law 196 trained workers. To date, our approved course providers have issued over 150,000 site safety training cards, most of which are, site, are supervisor site safety training cards and full site safety training cards, which means that workers are completing the potentially life-saving site safety training required by this historic law. Last year, the department hosted its first ever virtual construction industry conference, which focused on safety, innovation, and sustainability. In keeping with our focus on safety for the first time, our annual industry conference included sessions dedicated to worker safety, which highlighted Local 0196 and the importance of receiving site safety training. We held these worker safety sessions again in multiple languages this year. We've also started issuing worker alerts which provide practical situational safety information and straightforward guidance for workers in the areas that we see increased risk to safety. These worker alerts, which include information about preventing worker falls and performing facade work safely, have been distributed directly to workers on construction sites by the department this year. Finally, in June, following multiple construction-related fatalities in May, the department took swift action and announced the mobilization of teams of enforcement inspectors across the five boroughs to perform safety sweeps of larger and more complex construction sites to ensure that they are safe for both workers and the public. The goal of this sweep was to send a strong message to the construction industry that safety lapses on construction sites will not be tolerated. While performing these sweeps, department inspectors took appropriate enforcement actions if they observed any safety violations and shut down sites if they found serious safety lapses. As part of this sweep, which ended last week, the department conducted nearly 7,500 uh, inspections, issued nearly 1,500 stop work orders, and over 3,600 violations for safety issues. The package of construction safety legislation before the committee today, which the department fully supports, builds upon our collective efforts to improve safety with the goal of further reducing construction-related injuries and fatalities by providing for greater oversight by the department of general contractors who engage in construction or demolition work by licensing them, reducing the threshold to require a full-time department-issued site safety coordinator or site safety manager to certain construction sites that involve buildings that are seven stories or greater and requiring that they submit site safety plans to the department for review and approval, requiring department-licensed construction superintendents to serve full-time alongside site safety coordinators or site safety managers at major construction projects 
and limiting the number of non-major construction projects for which a department-issued construction superintendent may be designated. Building upon a building's bulletin issued by the department, which prohibited the use of standoff brackets for suspended scaffold installations by making that prohibition permanent. Also building upon a building's bulletin issued by the department, which improved the safety of cold form seal construction by creating new safety requirements to prevent overloading and improper installation of cold formed steel. Now turning to the legislation that relates to Local Law 152, which mandates the periodic inspection of gas piping systems for most building types, excluding one and two family homes. Intro 2259 extends the deadline for the second group of buildings that must comply with the inspection requirement. The department has no objection to this extension. However, building owners should not delay compliance with this inspection requirement. Intro 2321 creates a hardship program that would provide certain building owners with additional time to comply with the inspection requirements if they are not able to meet their applicable deadline. The department is supportive of creating a hardship program, but would like to discuss the specifics of the program with this committee further, including how a building owner demonstrates a hardship. Any program that is created should be helpful and responsive to the needs of building owners while recognizing the importance of complying with this inspection requirement in a timely manner. Intro 2361 requires the department to create a questionnaire to seek feedback from building owners regarding the implementation of Local Law 152. The, apart, the department already uses questions and comments it received from owners to improve the materials we use in our outreach, and we would certainly support this measure. Intro 2377 expands the scope of this, of this inspection requirement to include tenant spaces. This is a significant expansion of the scope of the inspection and will result in increased costs for building owners. Access to occupied tenant space for the purposes of conducting these inspections may also pose an issue and prolong the time it takes to complete an inspection of a building. This proposed expansion merits further discussion with building owners to better understand the impact it will have uh, for compliance. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you, and I would welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to now begin the question and answer portion of this starting with me as the chair and then moving to my colleagues who will also have questions. Uh, I'm gonna start uh, with the construction, uh, the certificate of no harassment. Um, has HPD considered uh, the, the steps that would be necessary to make this a permanent program? Thank you for the question, council member. Um, as you know, we have just recently uh, put out our uh, evaluation of the program and as part of that evaluation, it was very difficult for us, uh, given the issues that I raised in my testimony, to really do a full evaluation of the pilot program. And so at this point, um, while we see the effectiveness of the program um, in the data that we did have, we really feel that it's important that we continue to evaluate the program. Uh, as it relates to the pilot, uh, how many buildings uh, are there currently covered uh, by, by the pilot? So at the current time, there are uh, 1,143 buildings that are on the pilot list. The bill's extension, uh, will that cover more buildings? So uh, in discussing the extension of the program with the council, we have been looking at ways to increase the number of buildings that would be covered under the pilot. So those discussions are ongoing. What kind of feedback has the administration received about the pilot? So thank you for that question, council member. So we are, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, meet with uh, the advocates on a regular basis regarding the program. Um, we have received some uh, feedback pursuant to both those conversations and to other conversations uh, with the council and with others on the program. And I think that we're all in agreement that the program is, uh, has its effectiveness and that there are ways to improve the program. And of course, we're open to having those discussions. Has any of the feedback that you received been taken into consideration in the formulation of the bill? Is it included in the current bill as we see it today? I believe it is, sir, yes. And does the administration, um, I mean, I, I kind of know, but I gotta ask this straightforward question. Does the, the, does the administration support the bill? 
uh, again, we uh, support the expansion of, of the program to see where it can go to make sure that it is a data-driven expansion, to see that it remains targeted to those buildings most likely to experience harassment. So we are interested in continuing those conversations and we are actively doing that. Thank you. Do any of my colleagues have any questions on, the, on this particular bill? Uh, Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is with this uh, Certificate of No Harassment Program, how do you, what criteria did you use uh, to select the buildings? So and the other thing is that I want to see with this extension, including, you know, can we include area that are being rezoned and area that are adjacent to the rezone area to make sure that tenants know what their rights are and they can combat any kind of harassment that might be happening. So can you elaborate on that in terms of you know, outreach and uh, partnering with community-based organizations, those kind of effort mm -hmm. uh, in some of the rezoning area that's coming up and also rezoning area that was that passed in the past. So uh, council member, let me just step back for a second. And as you know, harassment is a, is a difficult issue and there's no one single answer to dealing with harassment. You know that the agencies, the city agencies, HPD, DOB, the mayor's office to protect tenants have used other tools even since the certificate of no harassment pilot program uh, came into effect. So we're trying to address the issues, not just through this program, but through in the moment responsiveness to tenant harassment issues. So I just wanna make sure that everyone realizes that the certificate of no harassment, while it is an important tool in our toolbox, is not the only tool. As part of the expansion that we are uh, looking at, you know, the data that we collected, we're able to collect for the past three years, um, we are looking at what uh, good indicators of harassment might be. We are looking to expand to additional districts. Um, we are having discussions about uh, districts that also share some of the distress indicators that the current districts share. So we are looking at multiple ways in which we can uh, identify districts. Uh, rezoning districts is certainly one way. Uh, adjacent districts is one way. But we have not yet uh, settled on the exact data that we're going to use in order to make that determination. Thank you so much. Right. And, and I'm sorry, excuse me. And the rezonings are covered under the current, um, the current law that's there. So the expansion is not necessarily going to cover new rezonings areas because those are already covered under the statute. Okay, so you're saying that the rezoning area are covered, so any kind of upcoming rezoning area would be covered. Correct. And what kind of outreach does HPD do um, to the tenants in those buildings, in the rezoning area and adjacent to rezoning areas? Um, so in terms of harassment in general, right, we have a lot of information on our website about what tenants' uh, rights are, uh, where they can go for assistance on harassment. Uh, for the buildings, once an owner applies uh, for a certification of no harassment and the process is started, there's a lot of outreach to the tenants in those buildings uh, to determine whether harassment in fact occurred. So that is the, the method in which we do outreach. I believe we post the buildings, we send our investigators to the buildings to talk one-on-one -on -one with the tenants. But are, are there any kind of outreach beforehand like in terms of the rezoning areas mm -hmm. and adjacent areas to them, are there, like during the process, mm -hmm. are there any kind of outreach that will be extended to residents? Just as a general educational outreach, so people are aware that they have rights. So mm -hmm. if, it, if it happens later on, they know where to go. Specific where to, to file complaints. Specific to the certification of no harassment program, you're asking me, council member? Yeah. Um, I will look into that and get back to you. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so we'll, all, we'll now be hearing questions from uh, Council Member Farrah Lewis, not Council Member Vanessa Gibson. Thank you, Chair Carnegie. You're so sweet. 
Um, I just have one quick question that kind of piggybacks off of what Council Member Chen uh, just asked you. So the administration is receiving feedback. Where, where is that information being tracked? Is there a particular uh, like portal where that information is being tracked? And in addition to that, the data that you're receiving and that you're collecting so you can determine if there'll be an expansion, where is that being stored? And when will, when will you be able to share that information? Thank you. So the, the feedback that we receive, again, as I mentioned, we meet regularly with uh, a group of advocates around this issue. So that's, that's basically a, a verbal feedback one-on-one -on -one with those individuals and our staff. Um, in terms of the data, the data that we are using is basically around the issuance of violations, is around uh, the, the data uh, on uh, uh, the, the um, I'm sorry, the data on uh, both uh, HPD violations in those areas uh, and the data on, um, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn it over to our data guru to uh, answer that question more fully. Uh, thank you, Council Member. So we actually just issued our uh, report and in that report we have reported on a number of metrics that we're using as um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Santiago was referencing. The, the data that we're using was created by the working group, the tenant advocates that we were referencing representatives from agencies, from real estate, council members, right? And so this has been an extension of that data that we use to try to predict where we should be uh, focusing efforts, and all of that is included in the report that we shared with the council uh, within the last few months. So I heard some of the, the, the stakeholders you mentioned, but does, does that include the constituents? Um, our belief is that we are uh, collecting information and, and data from the representatives in the, the tenant organizations, as well as through the process by which our investigators are regularly interacting with tenants, and we are constantly thinking about how to continue working on and improving the program. I wanna ask that you include them in this conversation and go a little bit deeper, because sometimes their voices are not being heard. So you can hear from us and everyone else, but just the general person is not being heard. So if you could include that in there, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I just want to note that uh, due to the late submission of intro number 2265, which is Council Member Cumbo's uh, bill on knob safety, we will not be asking questions at this date, but we'll be taking and asking questions later on that bill uh, due to its late submission. That's on 1817, sir? No, 2265. Per permanent option of permanent stove uh, knob covers. You may not have it, which is why I'm not going to okay. ask you questions. Thank about you, sir. It. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to now move to questions, uh, DOB. Uh, Commissioner, great to see you this morning. Um, has DOB consulted with any stakeholders regarding uh, these bills? Yes, over the course of uh, the last few years, the department has had multiple engagement sessions with our industry stakeholders. And so you, you've received, um, uh, I don't wanna say adequate, but you've received some feedback from those stakeholders? We certainly have received feedback and we expect as part of this dialogue to continue to receive feedback from our stakeholders. Obviously this department is open to hearing any feedback from uh, industry partners as we continue to strive to create a more robust culture of safety on our job sites. Uh, thank you. Um, I think, I don't know if I've mentioned, we've been joined also by my colleague, uh, Council Member Carlina Rivera. Uh, I'd, I'd like to go, you have a question? Sure. So I'm sorry, um, Councilmember Rivera has questions on the certificate her, of, of no harassment bill. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. I just have a quick question. I know we're going through quite a few bills today, so I'm just going to focus on the, the pre-considered intro. My question is really simple. I know there is opposition to this bill, but, but how do you currently determine which buildings qualify for the program? 
So I'll just start off by saying uh, we are not in opposition to the concept of the bill. No, not you. Just uh, oh, some okay. of the some of the general groups. I know we, we the chip has uh, reached out in terms of some of the concerns over the bill. So I would just love to know um, how do you currently determine which buildings qualify for the program? So as we referenced before, there was a working group that did a lot of data analysis looking at which buildings we believed based on various indicators um, suggested that there was a risk of harassment. And that was what the pilot is, is based on, right? This is intended to be a data-driven approach. So based on the working group's theory, we look at various metrics associated with building levels of distress, um, findings of harassment, ownership transitions, um, uh, sort of presence of significant amounts of distress as recognized by HPD programs and vacate orders, all of which, as we said, came out of this data-driven collective process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll wait until we uh, cover some of the other bills. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I'd like to extend the courtesy of my colleague, Council Member Barron, to give comments uh, on her bill. Uh, also, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. And the bill uh, that the Chair is referring to is Intro 1817, which talks about having written notification being given uh, to those applicants as to the status of the applications when they apply for housing, whether they've been accepted or rejected, and to give them the time and the opportunity to respond to any rejections and giving them also direction as to how they can file an appeal. Uh, in your comments, uh, further the bill says that um, the filing of a complaint would be with HPD or HDC if they believe that they've been rejected in error and that HPD would be required to provide training to the uh, marketing agents and that there be an opportunity for a compliance uh, line to be established so that red applicants can have the opportunity to have their concerns addressed. And in your comments, you say that uh, you have the ability, you want to have the ability to respond nimbly to updating your marketing guidelines, and you say the cost of complying with written notice would be significant. And I just wanted to ask you, do you think that the cost of applying, of uh, someone of getting a written response is not something that should be borne by an agency? Thank you, council member, for the question. So the expert on Housing Connect 2.0 could not be at this hearing. I believe uh, the council was advised of that, unfortunately, in advance. My understanding is that HPD has come a long way since the introduction of this bill to meet a lot of the goals that you laid out in the bill. And what we are talking about now is really the details of that implementation. But my understanding, and again, I am not the expert in this area, is that HPD is willing and able and does make notifications, uh, and, and the sponsors do, um, and that we have tried to address, taken steps in our marketing guidelines to address some of your concerns. The details of the answers to the questions that, that you're raising um, certainly should be had with the agency, and we look forward to having those conversations to really explore your concerns and allay those concerns. Uh, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad that you're explaining that the expert is not here, because I would tell the expert that in my community, applicants say that the problem still exists with getting accurate current information, and I know you refer to having moved to Housing 2.0. The transition was not a smooth one, and it is one which my uh, community residents uh, tell me is not effective, and they're still not able to get the answers, still not able to have the transparency, and that's the main issue, the transparency of knowing what is the status and the ability for them to realize that once they can get informed of what the status is, that there's an an avenue, a revenue, an avenue mm -hmm. rather, for them to be able to have that addressed. And that's not the case. And I just want to put this in context. We're talking about the disaster that we're facing, 
We're talking about this pandemic, mm -hmm. and we say how it has highlighted much of the injustice that this country has perpetrated upon people who are black and brown. Mm -hmm. And housing is one of those major areas. We go back to the New Deal, which in de jure and de facto said that blacks could not live in particular areas. So there's a longstanding basis of discrimination and racism that has yet to be addressed adequately. So we're talking now as the Housing Connect program seeks to provide some opportunity for black and Latino people, people of color, to be able to have access to this, that we eliminate all barriers and that we bear the cost for eliminating those barriers. I, I, I think that it's insulting to say that there's a cost, to even raise the fact that there's a cost involved for making sure that people have equal access. And I hope that in the future documents, that's not listed. And I just want to uh, say that this bill that's being introduced is in conjunction with my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Cumbo, uh, Chair Carnegie, and Councilmember Kalos. We all had various aspects of this that we were concerned about, and that's how they were joined together in this bill. Uh, so I'm not satisfied that the person is not here, and I hope to be able to have some written testimony that responds to the questions that I've asked. Thank you, Council Thank Member. You. And again, we, we are 100% committed to a fair and equitable process. And I think we should bear the cost for making that happen. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Barron. And you can count on a, a, a follow-up from, from this body in relation to your questions. Uh, I'm going to stay right there on 1817 for a moment. Uh, what kind of guidance does HPD currently provide to marketing agencies? And again, I'm sorry, Council Member, uh, but I don't have the answer to that question. I am not uh, uh, fully uh, uh, versed on the ha Housing Connect 2.0 process. So we will get back to you immediately with an answer to your questions. So you can, you can, you can uh, probably detect the, the frustration in all of our voices, certainly articulated through my colleague, Inez Barron. So if I, if I were you, I'd make sure I got back with that. Um, how much time is an applicant currently given to cure any deficiencies in an application? So just for the record, are, are, are any of these questions unable to be answered uh, I'm today? Because I don't want to go through every single one if you're going to tell me that sir. the Housing Connect. I'm not. We did, I believe we did advise the council in advance that the person was not able to be here today who would be able to provide all of the detailed answers to your questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the remainder of the questions into the record so that when we ask for our response as a part of the record going forward, you'll, we'll have your responses Understood. as well. Thank you, sir. So how much time is an applicant currently given to provide additional information for an application? When is an applicant, when an applicant is rejected from an affordable housing lottery, are they given reasons for the rejection? What kind of information is currently requested by applicants during the application process for affordable housing lotteries? And lastly, what is the current appeal process for applicants rejected for an affordable housing unit? How much time do they have to appeal? Does HPD have an oversight over the appeal process? Does HPD currently accept any complaints made by applicants rejected for an affordable housing lottery? So those are the questions uh, that we're expecting a response from HPD on, um, uh, hopefully as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to thank you, uh, Commissioner LaRocca, for your, your, your uh, indulgence. We are now going to go to questions that are directly related uh, to DOB. And we will start with uh, a few questions that I have and then um, return questions from my colleagues. Uh, so I initially began by asking those two questions as H HP as DOB consulted with any stakeholders, you, you replied yes. And as, a, as DOP, DOB received feedback, which also you, required, you replied yes. Uh, intro number 2262, a local law to amend the New York City building code in relation to final inspections for temporary construction equipment permits and prohibiting standoff brackets. How would doing away with the requirement that final inspections not be required for temporary construction equipment further DOB's goal of protecting construction workers from injury and stopping worker fatalities. Now, we, we share the same passion for safety, 
and we've had these conversations offline, online, every possible way you yeah. can. Uh, if you could just answer that for me. Of course, and obviously this department would not be under uh, entering anything uh, into a change or a new regulation that would lessen worker safety and the safety of the public. We have a dual role here. Obviously we want to ensure that there's no uh, no harm to members of the public. The particular provision that you're speaking of, Chair, really is does not forward our goal of ensuring our resources are spent um, where they are seeing work occurring. This would change the onus and instead of uh, requiring an inspector to um, uh, uh, attend to a site after the temporary uh, equipment has been removed, we'll ensure that uh, contractors notify the department of such removal and that our, um, our efforts remain focused on ensuring work is moving forward in accordance with our codes and ensuring that that work is maintaining a safe environment for uh, members of the public as well as um, workers on site. So, so thank you, but um, not but. Uh, 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 for the record and in layman's terms, can you explain what a standoff bracket is? Sure, so uh, in the most simplistic manner, a standoff bracket is a, um, a piece of metal or steel that is used to basically push a um, suspended scaffold further away from a ledge so you get a change of angle. Oh, why is a standoff bracket uh, uh, considered so dangerous? So back in 2019, we saw a number of incidences, one in which included a fatality. And at that time, we really evaluated what was happening on the site. So standoff brackets, this piece of metal that's used to change the angle of the ropes that come down for a suspended scaffold, at the time of those incidences, we really focused in on how the standoff bracket alters um, the loads imposed on a parapet. So when you have a suspended scaffold that's going down a building, you see it, we all see it. Um, you know, if you see a window washer on the side of a wall, sort of same thing. So on some, uh, some buildings, um, uh, the riggers who are using the standoff, the suspended scaffold are using what we call a sea hook basically a C that you put on top of a parapet and that is what is allowing the suspended scaffold to come make its way down the building. The engineers at the Department of Buildings really honed in on the standoff bracket and the, um, the changes that that little device does to the, uh, to the math, to the engineering, to whether a building's parapet can actually withhold that um, uh, change in load. So that we thought um, was a very significant problem, which is why we went ahead with uh, Buildings Bulletin in 2019, prohibiting the use of this device. And since then, um, we've had a host of conversations prior to the bulletin and since the bulletin with our industry partners in ensuring that they understood our rationale for what we were doing. Um, and uh, uh, the compliance has been tremendous, and I think the industry has been, uh, has widely, uh, has received this bulletin quite well. So we're looking to go forward and codify it. Uh, how, how frequently are standoff brackets used? Well, since the, uh, as I mentioned, we, we did issue a building's bulletin um, uh, prohibiting the use of standoff brackets in 2019, and since that time, We've seen very good compliance. We've not seen these devices reintroduced to the field. So again, this is an effort to ensure we codify this building bulletin and, uh, and continue to ensure uh, uh, suspended scaffolds um, are, are appropriately used and safely used. Is there an increased financial cost to construction companies uh, based on um, doing away with? None that we're aware of. Well, getting rid of them, well, I'm sorry, how does DOB know of any fatalities related to the use of standoff brackets? So in other words, uh, we, we've seen uh, that you and this committee and us working together have seen um, uh, safety and fatalities. How do you know that you can attribute any fatalities actually to, to this device? So again, 
um, I apologize, not again, actually. I haven't, haven't mentioned this yet, sorry. Um, as you know, though, after any fatality on a construction site, the Department of Invest uh, Buildings does a thorough investigation of that fatality, uh, who, what, where, when. And we're looking to determine what, uh, obviously, what went wrong on the site sequence, but were there any factors um, that could have contributed to that fatality or major incident. Um, and in the instance of standoff brackets, we did look, as I mentioned, there were four incidences just in 2019, one of which where we had a fatality. And in those instances, we did determine that the use of uh, the standoff bracket was a contributing element of what went wrong on those job sites. So again, you know, the engineers look thoroughly at the, um, at the piece of equipment um, to ensure uh, that the action we were taking back in 2019 with the building's bulletin was justified. And we believe very firmly that the use of standoff brackets um, alters the engineering in such a way that it creates unsafe conditions um, and that sea hooks can and should continue to be used safely and doing so means doing away with standoff brackets. And since the bulletin went out in 2019, as I mentioned, we've seen very strong compliance. Uh, um, so it's, it's hard for me to fathom this in, in my mind. Is there any way that you could describe to the best of your ability um, a fatality that was, that you, that, that, that it, the investigation believed contributed, I'm sorry, the, the use of um, this device contributed to uh, a fatality? Like, is there, is there one instance that you, and I'd only ask you for one, is there one instance? Sure, so there was an incident back in April of 2019 in Manhattan on 50th Street where we believe that the standoff bracket attributed to that, uh, that incident where a worker um, was struck by a coping stone that had come loose um, because of the failure at the parapet level. So has DOB received feedback from stakeholders on this particular bill? I know you yes. initially said. We did. Prior to issuing the building's bulletin, we had a number of conversation with the uh, trade organizations in the industry that are specifically impacted by this. Um, and again, our conversations with the industry have been very good, very strong. They are our partners in all of this. And obviously, our job is to support their ability to do work safely. And our conversations uh, around the prohibition of this particular uh, uh, material um, were, were quite good, and they understood exactly why we were going forward the path we were. And I don't believe we had any strong objections to that. So does, uh, does the administration have any concerns, and does it support this bill? Uh, no, this is a bill that the department fully supports the uh, prohibition of standoff brackets codifying our building's bulletin from earlier, uh, from 2019. Uh, thank you. Do, do any of my colleagues have questions on this particular bill? If not, we'll, we'll move on to uh, intro 2263, a local law to amend the New York City building code in relation to the definition of major building. What is accomplished by changing the definition of major building. So currently a, a building that is deemed a major building right now is a building that is 10 stories or greater. Um, with the redefinition that the department is seeking, we're looking to uh, amend the definition to include um, uh, buildings seven stories or greater um, or 75 feet in height. So we believe that the redefinition will meet one of our goals, which is increasing safety, particularly by ensuring additional um, dedicated site safety personnel be on a job site. So currently a major building is required to have a dedicated safety professional on that job site, ensuring um, that the building code as it relates to safety is being adhered to. So we believe this shift from 10 to 7 will further our efforts in ensuring a greater uh, uh, degree of safety. Is there any way that you could point to how this change will directly impact 
the safety of workers? So we believe very strongly, and we've seen this um, with the implementation of uh, Local Law 196 and with the um, creation of our Construction Safety Compliance Unit. We know, obviously, workers having the information being trained in the relevant parts of their job. And, and let's be honest about construction work. It is a, it is a challenging profession. Our workers who go out uh, every day to, to earn a living for themselves and their families are doing a very hard job. So looking at um, the worker it's, uh, themselves, which is what the council did when, when you, you all passed 196 and the, um, was quite substantial. We couple that with the proactive inspections, which is creating um, additional oversight on sites themselves to make sure that compliance is in fact adhered to. We think those two uh, uh, efforts really did lead us down this path of looking at how we can increase um, supervision on job sites and a number of the bills that we'll talk about um, are related to ensuring additional supervision on job sites and just having a dedicated person whose job it is to ensure um, s nothing but safety of a site is so critical when you talk about um, these larger construction sites that have a lot of things going on at any given moment. So we feel very strongly that the additional dedicated supervision is the step in the right direction if we are um, looking to achieve deeper uh, reductions in uh, incidences as well as fatalities. So from a numbers perspective, how many more buildings would be included um, uh, with this change in language? So uh, with the redefinition of major building to capture seven-story buildings uh, and above, we're looking at approximately 300 additional uh, jobs. Um, does the, and I, I assume, I believe I heard you say that the administration fully supports this bill? That is correct, sir. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from my colleagues on uh, intro 2263? Yes, Carlina Rivera. Hi there. Hi. I had a, uh, what consideration led to the three year period that's proposed in the current bill text? So again, I, I mentioned earlier, we really do believe we are partners with the industry in, in ensuring their ability to work. We are the Department of Buildings, we are certainly uh, advocates for development, whether that be new building or maintaining existing building stock, which is critically important. So we understand the industry, we understand, understand the industry's ability to meet the deadlines, and this is an effort to ensure our partners, the industry, is a are able to actually uh, bring on the additional capacity needed um, to fully be in compliance with this. So we believe three years is responsive um, to the industry. Understood, and, and what interim safety measures are possible? We certainly should talk about uh, potential step ups, if you will, and I'm happy to have that conversation with the committee as well as the industry on how we can achieve um, uh, the goal of this bill in more incremental steps getting us to a three-year uh, deadline. So certainly happy to have that conversation. I look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd just like to go back really quickly. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal has uh, a question on the certificate, the certificate of no harassment. Thank you so much, Councilmember Carnegie. Um, Commissioner DeLaRocca, I have a quick question about the certificate of no harassment extension, um, timeline extension, which I'm excited about. And uh, council member, that's actually for HPD. It is? Oh. Oh. I, I think of it more as a DOB thing. Um, because uh, the construction task force um, has been looking at uh, these bills, I mean, sorry, these buildings. So, so my question is to any commissioner, um, why not apply it to the whole city? As I read the bill, it's just for an additional set of buildings. 
a set of districts, my apology, why not apply it citywide? And I ask that because there are always buildings in my district that where this type of harassment is going on, um, but as, not as much as in other districts. So thank you for the question, council member. I think we want to stay in line with the originally conceived idea of the program, which as discussed with the working group was really targeted, right? The idea is to really target this program to buildings and areas where there's an indicator of harassment. And in part, the program is citywide in that if there is a finding of harassment, no matter where in the city that happens, it does come onto the list. So we are you know, looking at what additional steps we can take to add buildings, but we really want to target this program, especially given, as you know, all of the work that DOB has been doing, that we have been doing in other areas to make sure that harassment is addressed in its many forms. That makes good sense, thank you. And did you have any, uh, again, apologies, I was at another event. Um, do you have any objections to this bill? Um, we're t discussing the details still with the council. Okay. Um, we would like to work out some of the, the specifics of it, but I think the concept and the, the continuation of the program uh, and uh, an expansion in some way of the program is certainly part of the conversation. Okay, and so for the record, I just wanna say that this has been a critical program um, and that you know I would urge the city to um, enable more buildings to be in the rubric of requiring a certificate of no harassment. Um, you know, this is the thing that's been, I think, buried for so many years, all the buildings that are harassing and terrorizing the tenants. Those are the ones that we have all focused on. Thank you very much, Commissioner. You're very welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I just want to state for the record, due to the sheer volume of the amount of bills that we have today, uh, especially in construction site safety. I'm going to try to truncate some of the questioning because there is a sincere effort on my part to be able to hear from the public. And um, so uh, this is not generally the way that the hearing would be constituted, but it's important for me to get through uh, these site safety bills with the commissioner so that I can hear directly from the public. Um, so on the next bill, uh, 2264, uh, which is a local law to amend the New York City building code in relation to coal form steel construction. Can you please just explain in layman's terms what this bill accomplishes? Thank you, Count, uh, Chair. So the bill accomplishes um, uh, a, a important um, aspect of our job here, which is ensuring further safety on sites. Cold form steel is a material used, commonly used, it is a safe, reliable, cost-effective material. However, when used improperly, can cause collapses of buildings, which obviously can lead to death. We have seen a number of collapses because of the improper use of this material, um, including a fatality in the Bronx in 2019. So similar to standoff bracket, we reviewed the incidences identified the challenges those sites had and issued a building's bulletin correcting um, what we thought were uh, issues sites had, and we are looking to codify that here. So this will improve the safety on sites where cold form steel is being used. So you are fully in agreement with the current bill as is written? Yes. Do any of my colleagues have questions about this particular bill? If not, we're going to move to intro 2276, a local law to amend the New York City building code in relation to construction superintendents and repealing se sections 3210-8-3 and 3310-8-6 of the New York City building code in relation to inspections required by site safety managers or coordinators and in relation to reasonable prudence required by site safety managers or coordinators to ensure safety. This bill requires that a permit holder submit a statement to DOB attesting that the site safety plan meets certain requirements. Will DOB review the site safety plans to ensure that they meet these requirements? Yes, as the department does currently for all major buildings, we do accept, review, and approve site safety plans, and we intend to do such here. 
Why does this bill exclude one to three build one? I'm sorry, one to three family buildings. So as you know, over the course of years, this um, city council, as well as previous city councils, have partnered with the uh, department in ensuring we have appropriate safety measures in place, and we've continued to expand on that. With respect to one, two, three family, uh, the creation of existing one, two, three family homes, those homes are built by contractors who are currently licensed. Those properties tend to be um, relatively uh, less complex than our larger construction sites where you have a significant number of um, equipment pieces being utilized that are quite large, um, quite impactful, um, and you have some concerns around adjacent properties. So again, this is consistent with the administration and the city council's mandate for as much safety as possible on sites. Yes, I believe so. Can DOB object to the appointment of a construction superintendent? The department licenses constructor, construction superintendents. So yes, there have been instances where an individual seeking to become one, as with our other license types, have not been licensed by the department. Um, and as with other license types, should there, that individual have disciplinary actions, obviously the department will seek um, uh, to adjudicate those. Does the administration support this bill? Yes. Are there any questions from my colleagues on this particular bill? If not, we'll hear proposed intro number 2278-AA, local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York and the New York City Building Code in relation to the licensing of general contractors. Does the, cur does the DOB currently have an oversight over general contractors? The Department of Buildings, as part of our requirement to issue permits to entities performing work, does have a perfunctory process in place for identifying contractors. Um, I would not say that we have an oversight of said contractors, which is the um, reason the proposal is before this council today on licensing uh, general contractors. Are they currently licensed by any other agency? Contractors may be licensed by our colleagues in um, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Um, they may or may not receive other documentation from the state, but as far as uh, for the, this Department of Buildings and our ability to ensure safety and oversight on job sites, no. Can you currently tell me how many contractors are registered with DOB to date? As of uh, earlier this month, we had approximately about 10,000 individual uh, entities. What does this bill seek to accomplish, Commissioner? I think very simply put, Chair, as, as we've talked about extensively, uh, and as my te testimony described, there is a need in this city to ensure that a true culture of safety exists on all of our job sites. And this council very um, thoughtfully put together legislation to ensure the continuation of our shared goal of safety. And we've seen that through 196. You've seen the department do that through the proactive inspections. The bill before the council is seeking to address a very um, big problem of our ability to ensure accountability. That is, um, the department issues licenses to, um, you know, over 20 different entities in this city performing work on job sites. And yet for uh, general contractors, we don't license contractors uh, in the same manner, in a manner. And what we would be doing with this bill is ensuring that there is true accountability on job sites for, um, uh, for the success of that job site and for the success of that work. And of course, we would deem success as workers and the public were safe and kept safe during the duration uh, and completion of that project. So we are looking to bring real accountability to the work 
uh, that takes place and ensure that we can hold bad actors accountable for their actions and actions that may cause fatalities and other um, incidences on a job site. What would be the cost for registering as a contractor with DOB? So currently we do charge for um, the variety of uh, 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 registration fees, that, uh, registrations that we have. Um, they can span between 80 and $300. We anticipate um, that with this bill, we'll be re revisiting the fees, and we will do so by rule, but the anticipation is that the fees will be um, in keeping with some of our other fees. So does the administration um, agree with this bill? Yes. Are there any questions from any of my colleagues on this particular bill? Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, Chair. I just have a quick question, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I just wanted you to share with us, uh, potentially, how could this bill adversely affect black and brown general contractors who are responsible contractors but may not be aware of any of the issues that may come up? Thank I, I thank you very much, uh, Council Member. Certainly, our MWBE population of contractors is incredibly important to this city, obviously, as well as the department. We are particularly mindful uh, of that group of contractors and their ability to continue to enjoy uh, the work that they do and do so safely. And I will say, the vast majority of contractors who are active in this city are responsible contractors who do uh, comply with the code. So what we've established with the legislation is what we believe um, a pretty common sense approach to ensure uh, that we don't create artificial bars to entry. So we want contractors who are practicing and those who are currently practicing with us and are active in our system will be grandfathered when the bill goes into effect. And again, as, as uh, Councilmember Rivera pointed out in her question, you know, we're looking at opportunities to support the industry and simultaneously bring us all up in terms of safety compliance. We think we can do both. We know we've done both in the past, but we also know that our partners need to be able to successfully get there. And so we've um, incorporated in the bill a runway for uh, implementation that we think is appropriate to the uh, requirements that we're setting forth and also responsive to the fact that we have contractors working right now and they will be able to be grandfathered into the new provisions and obviously they will get folded into the loop when their time comes. So we don't believe there are any barriers to entry for our MWBE contractors with the bill that we proposed and we believe our, our, the vast majority of our contractors who are safe um, and code compliant and run a very good business will be able to very seamlessly transition into this new structure. Thank you for that, it's very thorough, so thank you. And will there be some type of outreach component done? Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member, thank you, Commissioner. Um, if there are no more questions on that particular bill, we're gonna move into 2259, a local order in relation to an extension of the deadlines for inspection and correction of the building gas piping system in certain community districts. How many property owners complied with local law 152 during the first cycle of inspections? Do you have that number? Yes. Thank you. I most certainly do. Bear with me one second, sorry. So to date, we've received about 57,000 applications um, uh, for all uh, total. Um, yes. Has DOB issued any violations related to noncompliance during this period? As you know, the deadline for the first cycle was um, uh, extended by this council in which we were supportive of that action. So we've not issued violations. Currently, we are really focused on ensuring uh, greater information uh, uh, to property owners who are responsible um, for completing these deadlines and ensuring that they are capable uh, with our information of, of achieving this. Did this first cycle of inspections uncover any illegal or unsafe piping? 
Um, as professionals are required to already, we have certainly received some notifications from our licensed master plumbers of deficiencies that they've found and uh, where we've received those notifications, as is true throughout the rest of the department where licensed professionals and other registered professionals are required to notify us of this, we do follow up with, with any and all appropriate actions. Thank you. The, has DOB received any requests from property owners in community districts 2, 5, 7, 13, and 18 to extend the deadline? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, has DOB conducted any outreach to property owners in these districts? So we did, uh, we launched a very large campaign. We did a mailer to every property that we identified as being uh, was required to conduct this. We've done uh, extensive service notices through our email distribution list, as well as updates uh, on our website, including a dedicated page for 152. So we've done a number of different outreach strategies. We've talked to over 3,000, well over 3,000 individuals just from the mailer that we did to, cl uh, to clarify any questions they, that they may have. So we've heard um, a fair amount back. Is there a partnership on the horizon to get this information out with nonprofits and or other stakeholders in the community? Oh, we would most certainly welcome any opportunity to partner with any stakeholder. We've included information in our community newsletters um, that gets distributed to elected officials as well as community boards and other associations. So the more we can do that, certainly the better. Are there any, are there any, resources available to property owners who are unable to comply with the requirements of Local Law 152 by the deadline? As it stands, no. However, with the legislation the Council's introduced, certainly that could be a potential and we would be, we would welcome the opportunity to talk more about that and understand the criteria for that. Has DOB contemplated suspending or deferring any penalties associated with not being able to comply? You know, we certainly have discussed it, and as I mentioned, we're really focused on ensuring property owners are aware, uh, first and foremost, of the requirement and have an opportunity to discuss with a member of the department their um, to-dos in order to achieve this uh, mandate, this legislative mandate. So that's, that's been our focus, and it will remain our focus. We want to ensure compliance um, and ensure that folks are armed with the knowledge that they need to do this. Does the administration support this bill? The extension of the deadline, yes. Yes. Uh, are there any questions from any of my colleagues on this particular bill? Yes, Colina Rivera and then Ben Kalos. Hi there, thanks again. The chairman asked about, specifically about community districts 2, 5, 7, 13, and 18. What alternate gas safety measures will be considered in these districts prior to the extension? Well, I think you know, Council Member, and obviously you have a very uni unique vantage being uh, that unfortunately your district has seen some of the more um, uh, terrible outcomes of failures here. But um, we think 152 as, as intended is really important in ensuring a continued safe environment. We are supportive of the extension. As I mentioned in my testimony, we are encouraging property owners not to wait. We certainly were uh, supportive the first time the um, uh, provisions were extended um, from December to June of this year. And again, even then, we were uh, encouraging owners to do it. I think the city has among the, the most robust codes, not only around gas piping, but in general, um, we have some of the most robust codes in this country. So I believe the safety is there. I believe uh, the good reasoning behind the bills today, and we certainly look forward to continuing to work with this council on opportunities to strengthen where we may have them. And I know that you mentioned that you hadn't heard any requests from property owners in these districts to extend the deadline. But what plans does DOB have for outreach specific to these districts should the bill pass? We sh I mean, I would be happy to talk to you about any ways that you think would be um, more successful outreach. As I mentioned, we have pages web dedicated on our website. We've issued service notices around this, um, which goes to our, our uh, email network. 
We've done a mailer to property owners across the board in the city detailing this information. So um, uh, we're more than happy to, to partner with any council member, yourself included, obviously, and community groups in making sure this information gets to property owners so they can act on it. And, and my last question is, has COVID impacted any of the requirements or due dates for local law 152 compliance? Certainly COVID was a component of what we heard um, uh, as, a, as a reason for pushing the first deadline out from December last year to June of this year. Uh, you know, our licensed professionals in this instance, plumbers uh, are actively out working and so we don't expect that there is an issue in terms of their capacity. But again, we stand uh, ready and willing to work with this council on opportunities to ensure compliance um, through first and foremost, making sure individuals know that they have to comply with something. Certainly would help with that outreach, of course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Kalos has uh, agreed to ask his questions at the end, so we'll move on to Local Law 2321. A lot of the questions I'm gonna ask you in relation to that, I feel like we ex asked and were answered in the previous law, so I will just ask you, uh, does the administration support this bill? Yes. Thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues on this particular bill? If not, we're gonna move on to intro 2361, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to creating a questionnaire related to the inspection and correction of building gas piping systems. Uh, does DOB currently solicit feedback from property owners regarding issues with or complaints about local law 152? As I mentioned, um, we've done a number of different uh, outreach types around Local Law 152. I think probably the most successful was um, sending letters to property owners in very plain language that says what they have to do and by when. Um, we've received thousands of communications back from just that single piece of uh, mail. So we think um, we've heard a lot of feedback um, uh, yes, we've heard a lot of feedback. Does the administration support this bill? Yes. Are there any questions from my colleagues on this bill? If not, we'll... Speaking of 2377, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to extending the physical scope of gas piping inspections. Has DOB received feedback from stakeholders about extending the physical scope of gas piping inspections required under local law 152? Yes, we've uh, heard from some of our industry partners on their interest in seeing uh, changes broadly to uh, 152. Has DLB com contemplated extending this scope via rulemaking? It is not one that we have acted on. Certainly we've heard feedback, as I mentioned, from our industry partners. We understand there's an interest at the council, hence uh, intro 2377. And I think it's one that merits a real conversation with all stakeholders about potential impacts to cost and the ability of a property owner um, and the time uh, for which in a property owner has to comply with these requirements. Uh, does the administration support this bill? I'm sorry, um, there are questions from my colleague, Barry Gredenchik on intro 2377. Thank you, Chair. I was trying to be quiet today, but uh, I failed. Um, Commissioner, it's always good to see you. Likewise. Um, we've had issues in my district especially with um, garden apartments, but I know it's not limited to that because I've heard of other issues in the Councilman Coos district. I'm sure this is true throughout the city. Um, you know, to make things as safe as possible, and we all want that given the, uh, the disasters and the many deaths that took place uh, in the borough of Manhattan, um, how do you get around all that, um, you know, can you just walk in and inspect, or do you need, you know, a warrant, or how does it work? Because I know that at Glen Oaks, where we work very closely with your gas operations people, it was a long time to get through every single apartment that was affected, um, and they discovered a lot of unsettling things, 
um, you know, stoves that had been hooked up in some cases decades ago. Thankfully, nobody blew up or anything like that. But how do we work to ensure that uh, we get cooperation and, um, and maximum safety? Thank you, Council Member. I think, you know, that is a very good question you raise. And again, something that we're, we would want to discuss further with this committee, with industry, certainly, and with property owners, because the, the, the concerns are valid. They're real. Obviously, we're all interested in ensuring um, uh, safety and where we can make uh, changes to increase that, certainly. Uh, uh, important for us to do that. And as I mentioned, we already have some of the most rigorous codes in the nation. So, uh, you know, these are additive to that and they're valuable, um, but we do have to have that conversation about the impacts, again, as I mentioned, to cost, as well as an owner's ability to achieve the requirements um, uh, in the bill. I know it's not easy and, um, you know, one of the concerns I have is the length of time that people are without um, service, especially on gas and obviously, but it, it just, I wanted to put that out there. I'm glad to hear that you're speaking with, um, as you always do, with the stakeholders involved and I'd be happy to forward your <laughs> names if you need more. So uh, I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got to go off and uh, take care of Lanius. Uh, thank you. So the, the, the final <clears throat> question, I'm sorry, the final bill that was added to the agenda uh, late, um, because of that lateness, I'm going to read the questions into uh, the record and not require um, the answers today, but have a reasonable expectation that uh, you'll get back to me on them after I read them. Uh, that's intro number 2265, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to to stove safety knobs. How do the requirements under the bill differ from the current requirements that a landlord installs stove knob covers? Can permanent stove knob, can, I'm sorry, can permanent stove safety knobs with integrated locking measures be installed or exist on existing stoves? Would this bill require a landlord to install a new stove? Would a tenant be able to choose whether they want permanent stove safety knobs with integrated locking measures or stove knob covers? Is there a benefit to one or the, over the other? How much do permanent safety knobs with integrated locking systems cost? Does the administration support the bill? If not, what are the concerns with the bill and are there suggested amendments? So uh, again, there's a reasonable expectation that in a timely fashion, you'll get back. With Certainly, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I have comments from my colleague, Ben Kalos. Commissioner LaRocca, this is your first time that I've seen you testify and been in the same place, so I have important questions. How are you enjoying being commissioner and how was your summer? I can successfully report or happily report that I like both uh, and as with everything, it's always too short. I yield my time. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you now for your testimony. I believe that we are going to begin to hear uh, testimony from the public. Thank you again, commissioners, uh, for your time. Uh, and again, uh, HPD, if you can get back to us on those outstanding items, it would be greatly appreciated in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you. So first, we'll be uh, accepting testimony from Assemblymember Richard Gottfried. And then uh, Murray Cox and Rolando Guzman. So if the three could join at the podium, we'll begin the testimony at, uh, when you're ready. Again, Richard Gottfried, Murray Cox, and Rolando Guzman. Assemblymember Gottfried. Uh, I, I think I think we lost your entire panel, assembly member. So you're on your own. Uh, only we can't <laughs> add the time of those that are not there. <laughs> Thank you.
they are actually in the balcony. Can we just give them one second to uh, uh, join us at the podium? Thank you. You can begin when you're ready. I ask that you give your name prior to your, your testimony. We're allowing um, two minutes on the clock, uh, not for the assembly member, but for the members of the public. So thank you. Assembly member Gottfried, if you'd please lead us off. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm assembly member Richard Gottfried, and I'm testifying also on behalf of State Senator Brad Hoyleman. Uh, we support intro 2309 introduced by council member Kalos. The bill will strengthen the city's ability to ensure compliance with state and city laws. The city's housing affordability crisis has been compounded by the proliferation of illegal short-term rentals. They cause rents to rise and take an, an estimated 15,000 apartments out of the housing market. By opening up these units to transients, platforms like Airbnb compromise the quality of, of life and, and safety uh, for people who live in apartments. We have made great progress, but we still have far to go. It is estimated that 85% of all active AB, Airbnb listings in New York City are illegal. Intro 2309 will give regulators new tools by uh, among other things, one requiring so-called hosts uh, to obtain a registration number and register annually, and two, require platforms such as Airbnb or HomeAway to have registration numbers uh, for units they advertise. While we support 2309, we suggest the following modifications. One, make the short-term rental uh, registry publicly available with registration numbers and complete address information. Two, require an annual report uh, by the city on the operation of the registration system. And three, uh, require, require appropriate tax registration collection and payment mechanisms. Similar laws have have passed in Santa Monica and Boston. In Boston, Airbnb had to withdraw more than half of its listings because they were not registered. Airbnb and similar platforms keep saying what good neighbors they are. By making sure that their practices live up to state and city standards and laws, intro 2309 will help make that so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, anybody else can go next. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Rolando Guzman. I'm the uh, Director for Community Preservation at St. Nick's Alliance. We are a local community organization in North Brooklyn. Uh, first of all, it's nice seeing you uh, all here. Thank you so much for uh, discussion in this hearing. Um, personal note, this uh, has been, I think, about 16 months since I've been testifying here, so glad to be here. Um, I'm here on behalf of St. Nick's Alliance, and we are um, to testify in favor of intro 2309. North Brooklyn is one of the areas with the highest concentrations of listings of illegal short-term rentals in the city of New York. And I just want to put in concrete examples what that translates into the community. Uh, we have a wave of displacement where tenants are being displaced in daily basis and there's lack of access, especially to rent stabilized apartments. At the same time, tenants are being facing harassment. They are facing landlords warehousing units, uh, denying to list those units into the market for rent stabilized units and at the same time listing those units uh, in different platforms as a short term rentals. We understand that tourists come to the city and they want to enjoy it, but that translates that sometimes at having buildings where parties are going on at two, three, four in the morning on a Monday. And just I wanna make sure that you all, that just to think what you're gonna feel if you have to go to work and somebody below you or above you is partying because they're coming out of the city. This legislation is going to help to curb a little bit this uh, 
illegal listings. And the other thing that is important is that we don't uh, oppose tenants trying to get somebody to help with the rent. What we are very concerned is making a business from different tenants, different landlords, and online platforms out of the expenses of displacement of New Yorkers. Thank you so much, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you for the perfect timing, Mr. Guzman. That was. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Murray Cox. I'm the founder of Inside Airbnb, a project which collects data on Airbnb around the world. I've also become an expert on policy regulation and enforcement by working with cities uh, also around the world. I'm the member of, also of the Coalition Against Illegal Hotels, and you're going to hear from some other tenants today. I, I thank uh, Chair Carnegie uh, for allowing me to testify, and also the other members of the committee. And I, and I thank Council Member Carlos for introducing this crucial uh, regulation, 2309, uh, for a mandatory registration system. Uh, for years, the city has struggled to control illegal uh, short-term rentals. In February 2020, just prior to COVID, there were 50,000 Airbnb listings, just one platform alone. 26,000 uh, were entire home listings, more than half. Uh, the city said that up to 15,000 units of housing have been removed from the housing market. That, they said that in 2020, and as many as 35,000 were illegal. Intro 2309, based uh, on Santa Monica laws, uh, where uh, after they introduced it, they returned 400 units back to their permanent uh, residential market. Uh, that's in a city about 1% the size of New York City, about 90,000 uh, residents there. Uh, uh, 2309 is required to reduce illegal conversions, housing in uh, unsafe buildings, removal and misuse of rent regulated buildings, and incursion of tourists into both buildings and neighborhoods. Uh, we think that there are essential features that shouldn't be removed from the bill, uh, including uh, data reporting, requiring tenants to ask permission and to restrict uh, unhosted rentals in one and two bedroom, uh, uh, one, one and two family homes. Uh, I urge the council to pass uh, intro 2309 and I thank you. Thank you, I just wanna point out though, um, your, your testimony, mm -hmm. including footnotes, mm -hmm. is very refreshing. I'm, I'm a research addict myself, so okay. I, I, I enjoy it. And I guess in my leisure, which never happens, I'll probably read through it and, and, and go to the references. I appreciate it. But, but thank you so much for the detail. Okay. Uh, I also appreciated the recommendations as well. Thank you. So we're gonna call the next panel, which consists of, thank you so much for, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, uh, Ben Kalos has questions, I apologize. Thank you, I, I will take uh, three minutes to just ask the questions. Uh, for Assemblyman Member Dick Gottfried, f thank you for uh, waiting for th three, <laughs> sorry, two hours to testify. How long have you been working on the issue of short-term rentals? And why is it an issue that has risen to the level of needing Albany intervention? And for Mari Cox as the uh, chair, a former analyst at the City Council mentioned there are a lot of colorful charts. If you could just explain the charts and some of the data. Well, we started working on this issue in 2004. Uh, we made our, our biggest, I think, initial step forward was when, with the assistance of the Mayor's Office uh, of Special Enforcement, we drafted and in 2010 got enacted the illegal hotel law. Uh, and then a few years after that, uh, well, the, the mayor's office of special enforcement, even before that law, uh, was very active in, uh, in, in helping to deal with illegal hotels. Uh, they were very aggressive in, uh, in enforcing the law. Uh, the law, the illegal hotel issue uh, is a problem because uh, it is a way for landlords to withdraw rent regulated units from the housing market and still draw income from those units. Uh, it withdraws apartments from the housing market that are urgently needed. And as has been already said, uh, you know, for the, for, te for the ordinary tenants in a building where units are used for illegal hotel operation, 
Uh, you've got noise problems, security. You've got strangers in the building that uh, nobody knows who they are. Uh, there are fire, special fire code provisions that apply to hotels that don't Thank apply you. to illegal hotel uh, operations. Thank you, Assemblymember. I only get one more minute for the answers to my questions if I, w you wouldn't mind yielding to Mari Cox. Uh, thank you, Councilman McGillis. Uh, there's two pages at the end of my testimony uh, uh, with some data on it. Uh, the second last page has a timeline of the number of Airbnb listings uh, since 2014. Um, I've also correlated them with key events like regulation, in enforcement. The trend has really been up until 2020, until COVID, and so none of the regulations really had any impact. Um, but it also provides a, a good timeline of the different uh, events that happen. On the last page, I did an analysis for the uh, European uh, Parliament a report that included a case study of New York City, and I broke down Airbnb listings by commercial, i.e. Um, someone that has more than one home on Airbnb, renting it out full-time or private rooms, and they made up 45% of listings, but 82% of revenue. There's some other stats there as well that you can, you could always ask me about um, later. Again, thank you so much for your testimony and the careful detail um, that the assembly member and uh, the rest of the panel has put into this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Now we're gonna call the second panel, and that, consist, that consists of April McIver, Vijay Dandapani and Nikki J. Franzita. I apologize if I have not gotten someone's name correct. So I, I ask that prior to your testimony, you just give your, your name so that it can be uh, uh, enlisted in the record. And you can begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie um, and Council Member Kalos. Um, I thank you for the time. I thank uh, Council Member Kalos in particular for sponsoring this bill. So I'm Vijay Dandapani, President and CEO of the Hotel Association of New York City. That represents 300 hotels with roughly 80, 85,000 rooms. And pre-COVID, we had 35,000 employees. We are str come out strongly in support of Intro 2309. For years, the illegal short-term rental industry has been a significant problem for New York City's hospitality sector, as it is for the uh, housing and affordable housing sector as well. So these short-term rentals have threatened to undercut the economic vitality of the hotel industry in New York and its vast contribution to the city's tax revenue, which was $3.5 billion pre-COVID, and over on the tourism sector of nearly seven, uh, $22 billion. Um, they've also diminished the availability of housing, affordable housing, uh, as we all know. Um, and the, the, we strongly support the passage because the, of Intro 309 because it would provide a crucial step in curbing it's the problem of illegal hotels, as we've already said. Um, which, uh, our industry has been decimated by the economic consequences of COVID. Uh, the, of 35,000 employees, barely 15,000 are today at, at their jobs, uh, while the, the short-term rental industry has been thriving. Um, the, <coughs> these booking services take responsibility for those who utilize these platforms, and this bill would help prevent bad actors through the registration mechanism that has been put in place. I might point out, as somebody else already did, that Boston and Santa Monica already have it, and it has had really positive outcomes, not just for our industry, but also for the cities as well. Um, we, so one, strong, Hannick strongly urges it to be passed expeditiously as it will enable the revival of our industry and restore the billions of dollars in taxes for the city as well as bring back employment to thousands of laid off employees. Thank you. Vijay, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. No, should we take it? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, my name is April McIver. I'm the executive director of the Plumbing Foundation, City of New York, a nonprofit organization representing small and large union and non-union licensed master plumbers, engineers, 
supply houses and manufacturers. Our mission is to protect the public health and safety through the enactment and enforcement of safe plumbing codes. Um, Chair, I, I know we've, we've spoke with your office uh, several times over uh, the local law 152 related bills, and that's what I'm, I'm here to discuss today. Um, as we've mentioned um, to your office before, we're part of a gas working group with Con Ed, National Grid, the Northeast Gas Association, the Master Plumbers Council, as well as um, the local number one uh, plumbers training center. Um, we've been working together for the better part of the last decade on gas safety laws. It is, you know, integral to our industry, to the, the safety of New Yorkers. Uh, so we do take the uh, local law 152 inspections quite seriously. Um, it, we are here to speak about 2377, um, but I did want to say with regard to uh, 2259, 2321, and 2361 uh, that you know local law 152 is uh, mandates critical safety inspections, and that any extension or hardship program consideration should be carefully balanced uh, by the council with with the importance of safety. Um, but our main focus is on 2377, uh, which seeks to clarify the scope of the local loan 52 periodic gas inspection. Uh, we commend the chair um, for recognizing that the law, since its impl implementation, which it's, it's been almost about two years now, uh, it does need to be fixed. Um, however, we respectfully believe it falls short um, of the needed amendments. Uh, and uh, I did, I will submit, if I have not already, um, electronically my full written testimony, and I'm not going to go through it because it's a little long, um, but we do believe that the uh, the scope section needs additional revisions. Um, rather than uh, what's proposed here, it really should uh, say that. Oh, sorry. Okay, I've got. Thank you. Uh, it should say that um, the scope of the inspection should include all vis visually accessible gas lines, uh, not inside residential tenant spaces, but anywhere the point of entry uh, is located. Um, and I'll, I'll rest there, but I do have several other um, pieces, and I hope that we can continue this conversation with your office and the Department of Buildings. Thank you. So just for the record, I have committed to continue to work with you to negotiate this bill to, to a, these bills to a place where it's not harmful, and, and I've committed to doing that. Unfortunately, over the last couple of days, it was difficult to, to get back and forth, but okay. that doesn't mean that the negotiation has halted. Um, you know that the, you, you've been around long enough to know that this process is ultimately necessary Absolutely. to hear bills, and then we go back and we have more conversations. So Great. thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, uh, Councilmember Kalos has some questions for VJ at least. Uh, how many hotels and rooms did uh, your organization represent before the pandemic? how many are back online and how many are still closed or down? So uh, we represented 30 hotels with 85,000 rooms and as I said earlier, 35,000 employees. Uh, about 160 hotels are closed either temporarily or permanently. Um, we don't know the true number of permanent closures as yet. Uh, and employee strength is barely about 15,000 at this point. If we pass this law, and 18,000 entire home rentals were put back to the housing stock. Uh, and all those people, and uh, as of the city, as of OSC's testimony, we're talking about 135,000 nights that were booked that they believe illegally according to their testimony. If all those were put into the hotels that are, uh, have been closed or temporarily closed, uh, what would be the impact? How many would come back online? Well, <laughs> Council Member, that's a really good question. We have occupancy today at about 62% as opposed to the 89% that we had in 2019, the most pertinent comparable year. But more importantly, our revenues are down 55% on average. So to answer your question, we think that would certainly move the occupancy up and eventually revenue as well in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from the next panel, uh, which consists of Peter Amato, Kyle Ishmael, and Julie Samuels.
So I ask that you state clearly your name for the record. Uh, you can begin testifying as soon as you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chair Carnegie and members of the Housing Buildings Committee for holding this very important hearing. I'm Peter Amato, Secretary of the Construction Safety Advisory Committee of New York, or CSAC for short, whose members consist of hundreds of site safety managers and site safety coordinators in New York City. Our board of directors include a former chief of the New York City Department of Buildings Best Squad, former DOB inspectors, and myself, a former assistant commissioner at the Department of Buildings. CSAC's mission is to advocate for safety on and around New York City construction sites. Over the last few years, we have worked closely with the New York City Council, Mayor's Office, Borough President's Offices, and DOB to shape legislation like Local Law 196. CSAC supports Intro 2263, but respectfully requests shortening the effective date to 18 months rather than three years. Doing so will absolutely save lives. The one floor of Local Law 196 was not implementing fall protection sooner. That took three and a half years, and as you remember from Commissioner LaRocca's testimony earlier today, 75 fatalities happened in New York City construction in five, the past five and a half years. That's over one worker every month. It's far too many. All too often, New Yorkers read about a construction worker getting killed. Unfortunately, the majority of these fatalities occur on low-rise buildings, which are lower than 10 stories. Of the seven fatalities in 2021, five were on low-rise buildings. DOB and OSHA have consistently publicized the need to protect construction workers on these low-rise buildings since they are more likely to have accidents and fatalities. Implementing this law is vital to improving safety throughout New York City. Doing so within an 18-month period will mean workers and pedestrians are protected from harm sooner. Don't wait 36 months. It will provide enough time for site safety managers and coordinators to get licensed thanks to the actions taken by City Council to shorten this process. As such, there will be sufficient site safety professionals available within the time period to, uh, to begin oversight. Any further delay is unnecessary. There is also an 18-month apprenticeship program for site safety managers that you may not be aware of that's very successful with both veterans and civilians. CSAC applauds Chief, um, Chair Carnegie and the Housing Buildings Committee for this legislation. The building code revision will ensure more workers, the majority of whom are people of color, will have safer job sites and will absolutely save lives. Thank you for holding this hearing. We welcome the opportunity to work with you and are available for your at your convenience to discuss this further. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Ishmael and I'm representing Airbnb today. I'd like to thank Chairman Carnegie and the members of the committee for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding Intro 2309. With the introduction of 2309, we are hopeful that New York City could be on the verge of clarifying the law and protecting the rights and abilities of residents to earn additional income that will allow them to remain in their homes, afford taxes, make infrastructure repairs, and meet other financial burdens. However, the bill would require some fundamental amendments in order to achieve this. As currently constructed, this bill places undue burdens on New Yorkers that would not only impede current hosts from utilizing their space for short-term rentals, but would also have a chilling effect on new responsible residents who are seeking ways to earn extra money throughout the year. While we fully support a registration system for short-term rentals in New York City, the bill would also require that hosts hire an engineer, architect, or inspector to certify the premises. Not only is there no other city in North America that requires this onerous obligation, which would cost hosts upwards of $500 and place New York City at a competitive disadvantage, but it singles out short-term rental hosts with an expensive burden that does not apply to the countless transactions that landlords and tenants enter into in New York City's rental market every day. If the intention is to ensure safety, New York City is already fully equipped to ensure safety standards given the extensive data short-term rental platforms are required to provide to the city quarterly. Additionally, Airbnb has numerous policies and systems in place to promote trust and safety throughout the platform. Further, the current iteration of the bill requires short-term rental hosts who are renters to obtain written consent from their landlords. This is another onerous requirement placed on would-be hosts who would more often than not find it difficult to obtain any additional written permissions from their landlord outside of their already extensive lease. Instead, at the point of registration, we support providing hosts who are tenants with a mechanism to attest that their lease does not explicitly prohibit home sharing. 
This bill, however, with amendments represents an opportunity for one of the last major cities in the world to establish a clear registration and regulatory framework for short-term rentals. And I will be submitting my testimony in writing. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, good afternoon. I, my testimony says good morning, but here we, <laughs> here we are a little later. Um, here, here, here we are. Here we are. I will be quick. Uh, my name is Julie Samuels. Thank you, Chairman Cornegie. Thank you, members of the Housing Committee, for having us. I uh, represent Tech NYC, which is a nonprofit coalition of more than 800 companies, investors in the city. Um, I, I would like to start by saying that New York City is going to recover from this pandemic because our government, technology industries, local businesses, they're all working together hand in hand to not just revive but also grow our economy, which is why I'm here today to submit testimony regarding intro 2309. Uh, the question is no longer whether home sharing has a role in New York City. The question we need to ask now is how do we effectively regulate home sharing to support tenants while also reviving New York's tourism industry to bring badly needed revenue to neighborhoods and families throughout the five boroughs. New Yorkers and tourists alike want access to home sharing. Um, as you heard from Kyle, you know, pretty much every other major city in the world has a, a robust home sharing uh, um, industry in those cities. And so we need to find a way to make that work for New York as well. Small shops and restaurants reap tremendous benefits um, neighborhoods see tremendous benefits, and again, it, it, the question is not when, or the question is not if, it is when we find a way to make this work. We're worried about this particular bill, which will prevent current hosts from utilizing their space legally, effectively, and efficiently. Um, the requirement to host, for hosts to hire an engineer, architect, or inspector is very burdensome, um, as you heard from Kyle, and as I detail in my written testimony. Uh, there are many alternatives to ensure safety in short-term rentals that don't create this type of financial burden. I'd also point out that requiring renters to obtain written consent from their landlords is so problematic. Any New Yorker who's had to deal with an absentee landlord knows this is the case. There are ways around this as well, uh, simpler, more effective ways like the, the ability to prohibit home sharing in leases. Um, in short, we are trying to you know, pull ourselves out of a global pandemic, and our city and our neighborhoods are still hurting, and we should be working together uh, to embrace new business models, but to do it effectively, safely, and efficiently. No one he is here, you know, saying that there should be a blank check for home sharing. That's not the point. Uh, but we are confident that if we work together, we can find a constructive path forward for home sharing in New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. I have questions from my colleague, Councilmember Kalos. Uh, thank you to the chair for his indulgence, and I've been doing my best to keep my questions within the time. Uh, for Airbnb, thank you for testifying. I uh, just want to re reiterate and just, uh, we, we, we both agree, uh, if you could just reiterate, I heard it stately, stated clearly, but you support uh, registering uh, for hosts. Airbnb absolutely supports registering for hosts, correct? Amazing, thank you. And uh, Ju Julie, good to see you. Thank you. I, I, Hi, Ben. I, I, Hi, I, I, I'm, is this, you can, you can call me whatever yeah. you want. No one, the only people who call me council member are people who are mad at me, believe it or not. Everyone else just calls me Ben. Uh, so in terms of the, your testimony, you also support registration of hosts. We do. We, report, we support working together to find a path forward here. Uh, and so uh, it's more to you, but it's kind of open question. So software developer here trying to figure out what the easiest way to deal with the issue of either uh, of landlords and tenants and to the extent that tenants may want to share uh, under under the law they're able to with two folks uh, they just can't give them the entire unit so then the question becomes from a data perspective you have garbage in garbage out so requiring people to hand in a lease uh, now we end up having lawyers, which might cost more than other people to review and figure out what does the lease prohibitly excuse it. Uh, most leases in New York City, the standard lease has a requirement that landlords approve a subtenant. So if you wanted to sublet your unit because you're leaving early or whatever, um, you need, I think almost every lease has that. So um, the, the written consent seemed like something easy versus having some sort of addendum. So just from a, a technology point, and for both either of you, but mainly for Tech NYC, what is, 
What is an alternative? Well, listen, I think generally speaking, we uh, would prefer that it is at the lease levels so that you don't have to go and chase down your landlord. Mm -hmm. um, this might be a question of implementation because you know, once you're in leases, they tend to be 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're talking about a new piece of legislation that might be mid-lease, which I guess is complicating. But as a general statement, what we worry about is each additional burden on the tenant when it is legal and effective to, to share makes things harder. So as much as we can accomplish it globally at a high level, then we're, we feel like then we're in business. I'll be very, very quick with something such as having alternative pathways. You can either get a letter from the landlord, which might be easier, or you submit your lease, and if uh, I, whichever way is the easier way for the applicant. Yeah, listen, I, I'd have to think about that, but I, I generally am in favor of alternative pathways in most of these pieces of legislation when you're dealing with regular New Yorkers who aren't landlords, attorneys, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you so much for your testimony. We are going to call the next panel, which consists of Joy Williams, John Mudd, and Alfred Roach. Again, I'd just like to remind you to please state your name uh, loud and clear for the record. Uh, you can begin. Uh, we're missing one person. You can begin whenever you'd like. Just state your name clearly for the record. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Joy Williams. I've been a host since 2013. I want to be sure this committee is aware of the draconian nature of the Office of Special Enforcement, an office with no oversight. And no, I am not given to hyperbole. OSC shows up with four or more, and one is New York P NYPD. This happened twice to me. In January of the pre-COVID year, the commissioner held a hearing to get the public comment. I testified. In March, I could find nothing on the city website. I called OSC. I was never called back. Two or three weeks later, OSC showed up. I refused to let them in. My parents taught me long ago never to let anyone, any law enforcement in without a warrant. Nothing good can come of it. As the lead officer left, he turned over his shoulder and said, we have other ways of getting in your house. I received a mailed notice of dismissal for half of the charges. I erroneously believed that all were dismissed as I had never received any other communication. Within days, four different OSC were at my door. They gave additional violations without providing an opportunity to cure. OSC appealed the, dismissal viol the dismissed violation, resulting in a fine of more than $10,000. Add to this the $30,000 I lost from deadbeat tenants. I met with o the OSC commissioner in October of 2016. He let me know that the small print on the back of the citation held me responsible even if no notice arrived. He also let me know that his office was behind and publicly sharing how his office was enforcing the law. The commissioner is committed to the notion that short-term rental is at the core of the demise of affordable housing. I completely disagree. I'm blessed to live on a street where redlining kept my ancestors away. Increasingly, developers are buying small buildings and permanently destroying rentable units for larger luxury homes. Rent-stabilized units are regulated on a premises basis, not the income of a tenant. The in there is no incentive for a landlord to rent to a lower income tenant. Comptroller Stringer reported that the city is dragging its feet in over 1,000 vacant city-owned lots, and many for more than 50 years. The other hosts, there are other hosts, and, I, and particularly homeowning hosts, feel that we are the target and believe the proposed law to be unfair, severe, and cruel. Simply put, draconian. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hello. Oh. Hello, my name is Alfred Roach, and I'm here representing myself. I fully support uh, intro 2309. Um, I have lived in my building for 27 years, and I have never felt as unsafe as I do right now by bad actors who are renting apartments in my building, and they don't live there. And they're renting to 
uh, groups of people, six to eight at a time, and they're also doing rave parties. They started doing rave parties at the beginning of the pandemic because kids couldn't go to bars. So they have 30 to 40 people in apartments at night being loud and smoking in the building. We have a non-smoking building. Our building is kind of small, 40 units. And of those 40 units, I can identify six units that are uh, used for a illegal Airbnb, bad actors coming into my building, leaving garbage around, rats, homeless people can get into the building because all sorts of people have access to our security code in the front now. We had a drug dealer who was, uh, who was uh, doing his business in our building, in the stairwell for a good year until COVID came about and then he couldn't get into the building anymore. So I don't care that Airbnb is legal, but I think that we need as many uh, vehicles to stop the bad actors. You know, and not, I don't think enough is said about the people who are, who are misusing Airbnb and the others to the detriment of somebody like me who lives in my building for 27 years and I do things legally. That's all I really have to say. So I support uh, intro 2309. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, um, I'm John Mudd. I've, I've been living in, within the Midtown community since 1984 and I've been the president of the Midtown South Community Council for almost as long. I support intro 2309. And uh, Ms. MSCC recognizes the housing shortage and the ma manipulation thereof and how it contributes to the poor health, education, cost burden, displacement, and homelessness. Now, these issues threaten health and existence in our whole society, and it's not an exaggeration to say that these illegal hotels contribute to that threat. According to Airbnb data from the Economic Policy Institute, the Airbnb effect increases the value of an area and pushes out the indigenous residents. According to information from the Harvard Business Review, the presence of Airbnb encourages landlords to decrease long-term rentals and enter the vacation rental market. Now, I've received n numerous complaints about constant traffic from short-term rentals and apartment being warehoused. And what this gentleman before me said, I've, I've heard that plenty of time from a lot of people within the area. I personally experienced the constant flow of suitcases rolling in and out of, of small rent-controlled and stabilized walk-up where I live. I mean, the owner of the building where I reside installed a reader card to allow people access to the building as if you were entering a hotel room. Now, many other landlords in pursuit of more profits will encourage tenants to move by harassment or ignoring apartment uh, and building maintenance needs. And I've been there, intervened several times between landlords and, and, and tenants who are, are harassed. In New York City, the issue of homelessness and affordable housing are intertwined. Shelters use is as an all-time high it's up 33% over the last three years. And the length of stay is, has ridden, risen 20%. Now, adequate housing supply would save many of those 46% evicted and overcrowded and 41% caught in domestic violence who were living in shelters and added to the 92,000 homeless New Yorkers in 2020. Now, what the lady said before me about them not being the sole perpetrators of, of the problem. And, and she's right to point out that the developers uh, have a uh, heavy hand in all this. They, they squash out the tenement buildings and they destroy housing. This is a homeless and housing crisis. I mean, Paris, Barcelona, uh, Berlin, Santa, Santa Monica have put in regulations and rules. And, and it's really about the a tenant who's, who's using Airbnb to survive is one thing, and having one apartment is one thing, but a tenant who's making a business out of uh, renting apartments and taking them off the market, that is another thing, and that, and we can, we're sh in short supply as it is, and we've got too, mu too many ho homeless people out there, 
and we need to start bringing housing into the market, some affordable housing, really affordable housing. And that's thank all I need to say. Th thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, there are no questions for this panel. Thank you so much for your testimony. It is incredibly important to hear every single voice on every single side uh, as we put forward legislation. So thank you. We're going to call the next panel, which consists of uh, Michael McKee, uh, Esteban Gabron, I'm sorry, I couldn't, couldn't see, and uh, Vivian Abuelo. Again, I ask that you please state your name clearly for the record. Before you begin your testimony, you can begin uh, as soon as you're ready. Oh, oh, you go ahead. Ah, uh, now you can. Hi, my name is Esteban Heron. I am a member of the Crown Heights Tenant Union. And uh, I just wanna go through this real quick. There's a couple of photos here that I printed out for you. Um, to give you some idea of what's been going on in Crown Heights in regards to short-term rentals. Um, you'll see the first one here is, a, is uh, actually taken in front of my bodega. It says, nowhere to hold your Airbnb keys, try this key nest. Um, this popped up a little bit shortly after the 2017 passage of the Bedford Union Armory rezoning, which uh, caused a significant uh, change in the demographic of my block. And, um, if you go to the next page, you will see this key nest, which I just happened to look up, is, uh, and it's just a picture of, of basically central Brooklyn, and the spots where these key nest locations are is this, uh, like a, a stunning example of what's been happening in, in the neighborhood, if you know it. Uh, it's, it's basically the places that have been emptied out of black and brown residents. And um, so I think that the, uh, the key thing here is that these things are happening, these illegal, uh, these illegal short-term rentals are happening. Um, we need to know where they're happening. We need to have the data. We need to be able to have this registration so that we can combat that. Um, and we need to uh, we need to do something about it. I mean, I have people calling me all the time uh, on my blog. People that uh, that we organize tenant associations for. The noise levels are, incre are increasing. The people with suitcases in the buildings. All the stuff that you hear. All the, all the horror stories. And um, I was struck by one thing that uh, the bodega owner told me was that it wasn't a whole lot of people that were doing these keys. It was a small number of people, sometimes maids and service workers that were turning over uh, cleaning rooms. So we have hotels running out of uh, you know this, this part of Crown Heights. You can see they're working their way down to Flatbush now, uh, and we'll keep doing so until we do something about it, so. Thank you for your testimony. Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Vivian Rufamaka Abuelo. I'm a member of Illegal Hotels Campaign for Westside Neighborhood Alliance. We strongly support intro 2309. In 2004, after my apartment building was turned into a commercial youth hostel by a new management, I joined up with other tenants and the Neighborhood Alliance to combat transient rentals in residential buildings. 17 years ago, there was no 311 code for an illegal hotel and Department of Buildings was not equipped to address the problem. In 2010, when Office of Special Enforcement was charged with cracking down on illegal hotels, this proved effective against landlords looking to make a quick buck on tourist rentals. When Airbnb provided a platform for ordinary people to monetize their homes, however, the problem quickly became too much for one agency to handle. A 311 complaint has to be called in, OSC has to visit the site when tourists are present, 
in order to right violations, and the violations must go through ECB before penalties can be imposed. Conversely, if a short-term rental operation is legitimate, it should be recognized as such and able to operate without interference. By establishing parameters for the legal operation of short-term rentals in New York City, Intro 2309's registration system would great re greatly reduce the guesswork. Thank you. I'm sorry, thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, I'm Michael McKee uh, from the Tennis Political Action Committee. I'm also a member of the Coalition Against Illegal Hotels. Uh, we have been working on this bill for two years. Uh, we are convinced that a registration system is absolutely essential uh, to crack down on illegal hotel activity. We do not believe that despite their best efforts, the tools that the city now has are adequate to go after bad actors, and we think a registration system is the way to go. Um, I want to state for the record that we have made numerous attempts to get input from both the Office of Special Enforcement and the Mayor's Office, and we have been stonewalled. We attempted to get this input before the bill was introduced on May 12th, and we've attempted to get input from them since then, and they have not been willing to engage. We are determined to get this bill done before the end of the year when there will be a massive turnover at both ends of City Hall and we would have to start all over with a new mayor and a new city council. There is simply no time to waste to have the tools that are going to be necessary to eliminate illegal hotel activity uh, once and for all. I want to be clear that our intent here is to go after bad actors, landlords who convert uh, residential apartments to uh, short-term rentals. We are not intending to go after mom-and-pop homeowners from Brooklyn who want to rent out a room or rent out their uh, homes. That's perfectly legal. Uh, we know that there are going to be changes necessary for the bill and we are ready to engage in those discussions. I want to give uh, a special thanks to Councilmember Kalos and to the Speaker's Office for their help with this bill and um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I believe I have questions from my colleague, Ben Kalos. I want to thank uh, Mike McKee and Tenants PAC and the uh, Coalition Against Illegal Hotels uh, for their work. Uh, we would not be having this hearing. It took eight years and this speaker to get this bill drafted. I also want to thank City Council uh, Lewis Cholden Brown for, for working personally on it. Uh, I, I just have to say, uh, for, for Crown Heights, Esteban, your, your testimony just blew me away. I didn't even know Keenest existed. So uh, I guess if, if you could explain why, I, I, so, so literally the bodega on your store has now become a part of the, they call it a quote unquote Airbnb ecosystem. But so my question is, so if the law requires a, a host to be home, why would a host need Keynest? Exactly the I, point. I don't understand. <laughs> that is exactly the point. Um, from what, what I what, what's the point? If you can well, right, spell it out so, for me, like a, I'm in like a six year old. Right. Right. So, if it, it, it's essentially giving you a way to not have to interact with whoever it is that's getting the key, which means that you're not going to be home, because if you were home, you'd be able to give them the key yourself. Uh, what they do is they give uh, the uh, the person that is renting the apartment takes the key down. Uh, they get a, a, a one-time issued uh, code that they then send via email or text to the person who's going to be uh, renting the place, and they never meet, they never interact. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly how that fits into a, into a, the the current uh, legal structure. I don't think it does. Uh, and again, what what I was told was that there was a lot of uh, maids, service workers, is what he said, uh, people that were coming to. If you look on the website, actually, for this Keynest. They call them, uh, I think what they call them is serviced apartments, um, which is essentially just like, you know, they turn, they turn down your bed. So it is a, uh, like, it's almost like a management company is running out of these places. And they're literally, they're, they, they come down every two blocks now. So they started up in, uh, you know, a little bit north of Eastern Parkway, then uh, Union Street. Now they're down on Carroll. They're just working their way down. So, so, so there are seven key nests, and is each key nest one unit that they're serving, or is it like 10, or, or we don't know? He didn't even know because they, they issue codes. And so it's like a very, 
they don't really know what's going on. They get paid. I don't, you know, I know, and it's not Airbnb themselves that's doing this, but they're a partner somehow or another. So I didn't know they existed until I saw this sign. And then just a couple of days ago, pu pulled up this, this uh, massive listing. If you look under Manhattan, they're everywhere. So they're operating here now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There are no more questions for this panel. We're going to call the next panel. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, the next panel consists of Victoria McLeod, Christopher Oden, Ame Thrasher, Thrasher, or Amy, or Ame, I'm sorry, Amy. I, I would ask again that you please state your name clearly uh, for the record before you begin your testimony. Oh, someone, just give me one second. I, we're, we're missing someone one else person. Coming? One second. Do I have to hold the, hold it down? Oh, okay. So, so who do I have? Amy and uh, Victoria. Christopher Oden. Thank you. Uh, Christopher LeBron. No, that's you. Tim Kayla. I believe Tim is coming. Hold one second. Yep, there we go. Tim? Again, uh, I ask that you please, before you begin your testimony, to speak loudly and clearly your name for the record, or you can begin when you're ready. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Amy Thrasher. I live in Queens. I have been an Airbnb host since 2016. After my initial assessment, after the first quarter, I was given the status of super host, which I have maintained every quarter since. I moved to New York from Scranton, Pennsylvania in 1980. The biggest problem I encountered at that time was lack of affordable housing in 1980. In 1984, I was priced out of Manhattan and I moved to Queens. In 1998, I bought a small house in Queens. Now, I consider myself the luckiest woman in the world because I have a son who is a flight attendant, so we are, are able to fly all over the world for free. However, we cannot afford to stay in hotels, so we stayed in Airbnbs, and that was how I was first introduced to Airbnb as a guest. My house is a mother-daughter, and when I bought it, my daughter lived downstairs for several years before she got married and moved out. Then my son's father, to whom I was estranged, he moved in and lived there for over a decade until he passed away. Unfortunately, there was no other family member to move in. I didn't know what I was going to do because at that time I was looking at retirement and discovered that I did not have enough money from Social Security and pension to pay my mortgage. So I decided to fix up the apartment and rent it out on Airbnb. Some Airbnbers state that this is a supplement to their income. It is not a supplement to my income. It is my income. Without my Airbnb unit, I would lose my house, and I have nowhere to go. My daughter lives upstate in a small two-bedroom house with a husband, a, a teenager, and five dogs in a snow belt. I'm a city girl. I can't go there. My other son lives in Pennsylvania, where I don't want to go back in a small house with 19 cats, so you can imagine how that smells. I don't want to go there. My other son shares a house with a, another person. I can't go there. I provide a service to people who, can, who cannot afford to stay in hotels. I don't know why this arbitrary bill states two people. 
I mostly rent to families. Families can't relax in a hotel room where there's two beds and one chair. I provide them with a nice space to relax, a full kitchen, a backyard, and these people contribute to the economy. They go to the grocery store, they go to the restaurants, they use the transit system, they go to Manhattan. They contribute to the economy of New York City. The city should be trying to raise us up instead of tearing us down. This bill, I find this bill to be very arbitrary and very ambiguous. Why two people? I don't understand. Um, the hotels, I know they're having a problem, but their problem is that they're losing business travelers, not families that I rent to. The goal of this bill is to eliminate Airbnb entirely. It's another example of the big guy versus the little guy, and it's the worst part of capitalism. I would like you to direct your gaze up there where it says, our commercial policy should hold an equal and impartial hand. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Press the button. Good afternoon. My name is Victoria McLeod. And I've lived in East Flatbush neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at this hearing as to whether or not this, is, this will be helpful to the community or the economy. I find that the people I rent to, the people I run, I've been running an Airbnb for two years. I started two years ago, as I said, after I retired as a single person. I also was a single mother whose children have grown up and on their own. My daughter lives upstate. And this was an opportunity for me to be independent and try not to seek assistance from the state or the city. Hosting Airbnb also helped me to remain, as I said, independent and active. I help people who want to visit New York City but cannot afford the hotels. It supplements my retirement income. It increases the economy in my neighborhood, especially the restaurant industry and the dry goods industry as well. They also get to see my neighborhood in the light, not that of which they see in the media. They see the real neighborhood. I believe that this bill will hurt the community and will also help New York, help New, um, hurt New York City's economy if it is passed as it is. So I'm asking you to consider whether or not some of the fines that will be levied against uh, Airbnb members would be fair enough based on the income we're earning. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Again, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Tom Kaler. I'm a member of the West Side Neighborhood Alliance, the illegal um, hotel committee. Uh, we've been a committee since uh, 2004. Hell's Kitchen was pretty much the um, ground zero for illegal hotels in New York City because of Times Square and the theater district, of course. Um, so one thing I wanted to do this morning was uh, read into the record uh, to the committee here uh, Airbnb's uh, actual statement in their IPO document submitted to the SEC on November 16, 2020, page 45, in which they clearly state to their investors, as well as into the municipalities in which they function, we cannot guarantee the safety of our hosts, guests, and third parties. The actions of hosts, guests, and third parties have resulted and can further result in fatalities, injuries, other bodily harm, fraud, invasion of privacy, property damage. We do not verify the identity of all of our hosts and guests. Now, this is what Airbnb is telling their investors. This is what they're saying to the people that they want to put money into their business. So the question for New York City is, 
what other business exists in this town that states we do not guarantee the safety of the people who participate in that business? Uh, frankly, sir, there's, there's none that I know. Uh, to my Airbnb hosts, uh, to both of you, I just want to point out that this bill doesn't, in fact, change any existing law in the state of New York or in the city of New York City. It only requires that hosts and Airbnb comply with the existing laws. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your testimony. There are no questions for this panel. Um, well, we're going to call the next panel. Thank you so much for your patience. June Broxton. Daniel Arbini and Sandra Mingo. I ask that before you uh, submit your testimony or before you give your testimony that you um, speak your name loudly into the microphone so that it can be read into the record. You can begin whenever you're ready. Person. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is June Broxton. I live in Manhattan and I'm a real estate agent and a landlord. I volunteer as a mentor for a Rites of Passage program in Harlem and Westchester. I attend church and sing on choirs in Manhattan and Long Island, and I enjoy growing herbs and veggies in my backyard garden. Today, I am here as a homeowner. I hosted a room for four years, but stopped um, due, due to the pandemic, and my intentions are to start back in 2022. But I started hosting for a few reasons. One being to help others who cannot afford $400 to $500 per night hotels. That's me. Two, I lived alone and desired short-term companionship and not long-term. Three, I was tired of being a full-time landlord while fighting illnesses and um, while on vacation. Because you can control it on Airbnb, you cannot have people there while you're away. You cannot have people there while you're sick, but if you have a permanent tenant, sometimes that's a problem. They don't understand that you're sick. And four, I was tired of being lumped together with those landlords who have large buildings, and I only have two units, which I live in my property. So if it had not been for short-term rentals, I do not know what I would do or have done. It has provided me the opportunity to learn about people from other countries and cultures and give me ideas of places to visit or vacation. The extra money helped me to pay for my extensive medical bills, which my health insurance did not cover for my particular treatments. My guests they used to bring in so much money to the boroughs. They knew about restaurants and found out about places and taught me about them. Affordable housing, well, let's talk about affordable housing. The real estate, as a real estate agent, I also saw six-figure salary people purchasing or renting apartments for people who would make 80,000 or 70,000. So that is what's boosting up prices uptown. I can tell you that for a fact. Um, I treat all my tenants and guests the same, whether long or short term, so why doesn't OSC do that? Why doesn't OSE do that? Why is there a concern for individuals staying one week versus those staying one year? If, if this apartment is not safe for somebody for one week, then it can't be safe for them a whole year, so why aren't we thinking about that? And where's the help when we have no tenants? I had no tenant for 18 months. Nobody was there but I was following the rules and couldn't do Airbnb and almost lost my home. So I'm trying to say to you today, um, I oppose this bill, this legislation, because I did not purchase my home to have my local government tell me 
who I can or cannot house in it. The OSE actually told me one day when I called, I could not rent short term to my own family members visiting. And I find this terribly ridiculous, unfair, and controlling. Thank okay. you for your testimony. Thank you, uh, council members. I'm Daniel Arbini and my family of six has lived on the same block in Brooklyn for five generations. Please let that sink in, five generations on the same block. Um, and with your help, I hope, and another five generations. I've also had the privilege, uh, privilege of meeting many of you in my capacity of volunteering, bringing help and hope through the arts to New York City schools. In fact, the last time I was in this room pre-pandemic, I was invited and part of that uh, uh, nonprofit as they were awarded a council member through the council uh, an award. My family additionally volunteers from my littlest kids to my biggest through our local church, helping those in need. Um, we've been hosting my upstairs apartment for six years now. My Airbnb story, I hope, is one that will inspire you on how Airbnb, Airbnb or hosting um, short-term rent rentals enables great things in New York City. The way I like to begin um, hosting starts with today. As we speak, we have a former Brooklyn couple along with their two young children staying with us for free. Why free, you might ask? They left Brooklyn two years ago, gave up lucrative jobs in the medical field to go to Lebanon and work with Syrian refugees. They gave it all up to go serve and they're here on a respite to get a break because it's very hard and dangerous what they're doing. Um, say they've been with us for the last five weeks and they'll be with us for two more weeks before they go back home to their new home. That is why we host on Airbnb. From the very beginning, we opened our home to friends, friends of friends and church friends, mainly from developing countries that could not afford to ever stay in New York but needed to be here. We have done this hundreds of times in between those special guests, and it is an honor to be part of their stories. We host on Airbnb so we can pay our mortgage, and I've been out of work for two years, so we can actually stay and live and, and not leave our community that we have the deepest roots you can imagine. I have a real concern that more regulation and legislation will only serve to harm us. It's a real burden, and, and, and it's, it's vague. Um, which leads to abuse, and it's restrictive. But more importantly, we were visited by the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement once, and it was a harrowing and scaring experience. And while they were nice, it was still scary. Being law-abiding citizens who give back to our community, you may find it hard to believe, but they literally went throughout my whole building, took pictures of every room. Um, being a minority household, we were pretty shaken up by it. In fact, my wife stayed completely out of the way. She couldn't, um, she, she just couldn't even be there. Um, the history books are replete, council members, with stop and frisk being rejected by the council and everything. This is no different. I ask you to consider that. Sorry for going over my time. Thank you. Again, thank you for your testimony. If you don't mind me asking, uh, what, what neighborhood in Brooklyn do you live? Cobble Hill. Yes, sir. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon, council members and ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandra Mingo. I'm a community partner with the 75th Precinct in East New York, where I host. I host contracted healthcare workers for some of the neighboring hospitals. I also work in a major hospital system in the city. I started hosting. Um, with Airbnb because of my experience with a horrific tenant that was placed in my home by the city and um, an experience that I do not wish to repeat. The destruction she did to my house was incredible. And I have to say, it was a, my house that I just bought, the whole place was newly renovated and when she was done it looked like she had been there 50 years and some of the walls were missing. Airbnb helped me um, to pay back the people that I had to borrow money from to get my, my unit back into a livable condition 
and most of all, pay my mortgage and keep my house. Since I started Airbnb in 2017, I met a lot of very nice people from 13 different countries. Some have told me um, if I didn't have such an affordable unit, they would not have been able to visit America. They utilize many of the stores in our area and directly contribute to our community. This legislation threatens to put me back in a position where I, I need to continue to struggle to keep my home. My home has been inspected by the DOB, the HPD, many, many, many times. I think over 50 times they've been to my house to the point where the, um, the HPD actually nicknamed my daughter 92. That's our house number. And they would see her in the street and call out, so hey, 92, what's happening? That's how often they have been to our house. The courts have deemed my unit, um, for that matter, my entire um, home to be legal and safe. What would be the point of registering my home for, for further scrutiny from an agency whose rules and regulations are a moving target? I am a law-abiding citizen and believe those who are bad actors should be penalized. However, they also need to know clearly what the law is and what the fair penalties are. I understand Airbnb is working to, um, to help to correct and I hope that you know, they're given the opportunity to fix the situation before this bill is passed. Thank you so much for your testimony. We're gonna to move to the next panel. There are no questions for this panel. I, I do wanna thank you though, as, as homeowners in a city that's increasingly growing unaffordable, uh, we understand here at the council what you're facing. So thank you so much for your testimony. It is, it is a pleasure to put uh, a face to the many stories that we hear in our office and here at the council. Thank you. We're gonna to move to the next panel, beginning with Christopher LeBron. Tamara Rivera and Karen Beck. Uh, my colleague, uh, Ben Kalos, will um, conduct the hearing just for a few minutes for me while I uh, excuse myself. Please identify your name and organization for the record. Uh, you may begin whenever you wish. Uh, please turn on your microphone. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Tamara Rivera, council representative for the New York City District Council of Carpenters. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify on behalf of nearly 20,000 members in my union. As New York City seeks to recover from the economic impact of the pandemic, it is vital that we incentivize and enable the growths, modernizations, and most importantly, the recovery of our important tourism industry. <clears throat> I'm here to support Airbnb and its position on amending this bill. Tourism is such an important part of New York, creating jobs, supporting local businesses, and bringing much needed tax revenue to the city. And we, now, <clears throat> and we know that as tourism returns to New York, home sharing must be an important part of ensuring tourism benefits for all New Yorkers in all of our di diverse neighborhoods. The return of travel to the city is helping to drive important economic impact for a tourism economy that saw 67% less travel, 1.2 billion in lost tax revenue and tens of thousands of jobs lost. It is also helping Airbnb hosts make ends meet. These are everyday New Yorkers who have turned to periodic hosting in their homes as an economic lifeline during the pandemic. Today I stand before you as a proud homeowner, thanks to the benefits of a good union career However, we all have to start somewhere. As a young adult, like many New Yorkers, <clears throat> my roommates and I depended on each other to survive. Sharing my home gave me the opportunity to save money and resources. With the intro of 2309, we are hopeful that New York City could finally move to clarify the law regarding home sharing and establish a clear regulatory framework for this industry. However, in doing so, 
we must also seek to protect the rights and abilities of residents to earn additional income that will allow them to remain in their homes, afford their taxes, make infrastructure repairs, and meet other financial obligations. As currently written, though intro 2309 would enact expensive and redundant requirements on everyday New Yorkers seeking to make ends meet. The legislation fails to provide requirements to the administering agency, the Office of Special Enforcement, on what types of units in New York City would be eligible for a permit. Further, it fails to require that home sharing, home share platforms collect and remit taxes to the city on their transactions an untapped funding source that is beyond necessary as we climb out of the economic devastation wrought by the pandemic. In closing, I'll just say that um, currently intro 2309 fails to deliver, but we join Airbnb and stakeholders across the city in imploring this council to pass an amended bill that addresses the points raised today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Beck, and I am a homeowner at the Park Vendome condominium. I've heard a lot of testimony here today, and there is a difference between legal short-term rentals and illegal short-term rentals. And I, unfortunately, live across the hall from an illegal short-term Airbnb host. I purchased my home over uh, five years ago. I, I used my entire savings to renovate the home. And ultimately, now, I am forced out of the home because I don't choose to live across the hall from a hotel. I live across the hall from a revolving door, tenants in and out, housekeepers in and out, luggage, strangers. I live in a full service building, but it doesn't help because the doormen are on the take. The, the board can't enforce the rules, the building can't enforce the rules, and when I purchased the condominium five years ago, I read the offering plan I read the rules, and I do not understand why we can't enforce the rules. We don't need just a law. We need the help of everybody here in New York City, labor unions, boards, buildings, to get together and allow people who want to live in peace to do so. I live life through a peephole so that I can document evidence for the city, for the building. I call 311. 311 takes 30 to 40 days to come and inspect the premises. The tenants are already gone in 30 or 40 days. The homeowner's back or whoever his assistant or friend is is back in the home. In closing, I want to say that I support intro 2309, and I urge the City Council to pass it. Thank you for having me today, and I'm sorry I went over a little bit. No, thank you so much for your testimony. What I hope is happening today, though, is that the perspectives that are being offered by various vantage points in the city are being heard by everyone. So it is, it is, our, it is our intention always at the New York City Council to listen intently to what's happening on the ground. So thank you so, thank you so much for taking the time out to provide your testimony. Uh, please understand that it is on the record, but uh, myself and Councilman Michaelos have, have, have really sat to make sure that we can uh, come up with the best iteration of a bill that serves the purpose of everyone. So thank you so much for your testimony. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, Good afternoon. Yes. My name is Christopher Lebron. I'm from Hell's Kitchen, New York, and I represent the 47th Street Tenants Association. Uh, gosh, where to really start? First, I was here three years ago uh, asking for the City Council to pass Councilmember Carlina Rivera's bill, which you did, and I was very grateful for we all were. Today I'm speaking and hoping that you do pass 2309-2021, Palmel, no changes. And let me tell you quickly why. 
In 2009, I returned home from St. Louis University to my parents on 47th Street. My mother was able to get a rent-stabilized apartment there after she had graduated in 1978 from Princeton. She was also able to get a rent-stabilized apartment for my grandmother, my abuela. 47th Street has been everything to us. As an immigrant, it is our home. Not Puerto Rico, Hell's Kitchen and 47th Street. During that time, neighbors disappeared and were quickly replaced by illegal hotels operated by management and by our building owners. Hell's Kitchen, as you all know, is a union working class area, or at least it was until Airbnb exploited the housing market of my community. We lived in fear daily as tourists came in and out 24 hours a day, some sober, some drunk, having to grab a bat to protect my door when somebody was drunk trying to enter my apartment. It's probably one of the most traumatizing things I've ever experienced. And I grew up during the crack epidemic of the 1980s. In short, this bill is going to give us an opportunity to register legal short-term rentals. And what's really important as to why, council member, this is an important factor. If you Google Airbnb, hell, NYC, or Airbnb, hell, LeBron, L-E-B-R-O-N, in the news tab, you will see exactly what happened when one of the basement uh, storage areas was converted into an illegal hotel. 26 apartments on my block were removed from the rental market. Real opportunities to start growth and put down roots in a city that we've all had the privilege to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, there are no questions for this panel. We're going to move to the next panel, which consists of Kit, Gar Kit Garrett, Alex Young, Skip Carroll. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Kit Garrett, a resident of Chelsea and support intro 2309, Coalition Against Illegal Hotels. 45 Christopher Street is a condo. Owners rent their units. I rented one for eight years. When Airbnb opened, each weekend, people with backpacks entered our building. They booked apartments for short-term stays using Airbnb or One Fine Stay, a luxury booking site that offered multiple units in our building, all illegally. As a single woman, I was extremely uncomfortable with strangers entering the building. My apartment was the first of 18 units to be burglarized, all using a key without forced entry. When I asked to see the security footage, I was informed that the cameras were not working that day. When I asked the front desk person why all these people were coming and going, I was told that they were instructed to hand over the keys to whomever asked for them. I moved to a rental building with a strict policy that forbids short-term rentals so I could feel safe. For the security of the residents, the safety of the people wishing to use short-term stays, there should be a legal system that lists units which have been certified for safety, cleanliness, and security. They should be equipped with sprinklers and smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Keys should be turned over in a safe manner rather than being left in a bodega where anyone can make a duplicate. Airbnb now has over 100 people employed as crisis managers who handle horror cases dealing with clients who booked a property that had been raped, robbed, had property destroyed, and even died. For the safety of guests, the image of New York City as a safe tourist destination, please pass intro 2309. It will benefit the people who want to rent their properties legally and help keep people safe and increase our tax base. Thank you for your testimony.
My name is Skip Carroll. I'm a 61-year-old disabled man uh, who's an Airbnb host. I live in my house. I've lived in my house since 1960. I want to thank the, uh, the committee members and uh, the chairperson for hearing my testimony. Three years ago, I was here at this very table telling you about the Office of Special Enforcement and how they gave me tickets in 2017. You assured me that I was safe with the new law because I owned a two-family home. Ten days after that, they were back at my home again, and they gave me four more tickets. I fought them. Um, I went through four levels of, of, of courts and uh, finally, the city appealed a final time, and then they won. I don't trust the Office of Special Enforcement to, to, to do what you think they're going to do. They targeted me, they harassed me, all because I was doing Airbnb in my own home, in my sister's old room. I don't understand, I don't understand uh, their thinking. They said three years ago that they, that they would treat me the same as they would a landlord with 60 units in the building. I'm obviously not that. Um, I'm not a number. I don't own a rental property or a house. It's my home. And all I'm doing is trying to stay there so I can stay in this city, the city that I've been my whole life. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. My name is Alex Young. I'm going to read um, right from the page. Good afternoon, Chair Cornegy and all present. My name is Alex Young a tenant in Midtown in a rent-regulated building and a member of the West Side Neighborhood Alliance, also known as WISNA, though my assertions today are my own. There's an aspect of intro 2309, which I love, plus one downstream benefit that isn't as obvious. In the building where I live, hosts hosting guests were never physically present and are still never physically present. Intro 2309 would make it clear that unhosted stays are illegal. Unhosted stays severely impede tenants' rights to due process. For example, if a tenant union wants to do a 7A petition to remove the current property manager in favor of a new one, then empty apartments and guests and third-party hosts should not be regarded as tenants. To refresh your memory, a 7A petition, actually any petition, requires that a tenant or tenant union presents to housing court a petition where the gathered signatures represent 30% of the totality of leaseholding individual tenants. At the risk of stating the obvious, I must emphasize that empty apartments are not tenants. Guests certainly aren't tenants either. An accurate headcount of actual tenants is in this case crucial, but because landlords want confusion and difficulty and ultimate failure in tenant petitions reaching the mandatory 30% which housing court requires, Landlords will continue to withhold as much residential data as possible, while also encouraging guests from online platforms to be in buildings. This preference, this preference breeds confusion so that the guests are mistaken for tenants, which tilts the odds to the landlord's advantage as the 30% housing court goal becomes an unclear and uphill climb for the tenant unions. Intro 2309 would help to mitigate landlords' reluctance to give information. The big takeaway from my testimony is that illegal hotel activity stands in the way of the right to due process. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll call the next panel. Charlie Samboy, Mr. Wolf. Felice Farber. Wait. 
for the for for Airbnb. Uh, Mr. Samboy? Ryan Manel? Ryan Monell? Donald Ranskate? I'm sorry, Ransay. Uh, I ask that you sta state your name clearly for the record. Before issuing your testimony, you can begin whenever you like. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, High Wolf, and thank you, Chair Carnegie, for holding this meeting. And thank you, Councilmember Kalos, for staying through the whole thing and for actually picking up the phone and returning my call twice when I called you. And we spoke for over 15 minutes. So. That for me was an exception, uh, an exceptional moment. My, uh, I'm the co-president of the Hebrew Actors Foundation slash union. Uh, we were formed three centuries ago in 1898. Uh, we are 14 years older than Actors Equity and uh, all our members are members of Actors Equity. The fabric of New York that made New York the theater capital of the world were the unions and the acting unions of the Hebrew Actors Unions that made Second Avenue the Yiddish theater capital of the world where we had 14 theaters at its heyday and Broadway. Neither of us ever crossed the union line or a picket line when we were picketing. So we both had great respect and New York became the theater capital because of us. I'm here to talk about the certain situations that Local Law 152 imposes on us in 2321 and 2359 that attempt to address the situation, but not yet, and it doesn't actually hit the mark. So the legal counsel may need to do a little tweaking here to get us just a little closer to where we need to be. Our building has been vacant for 10 years. We have not had gas in our building in 21 and a half years, probably 40 years. But Con Ed will confirm 21 and a half years, but they will not memorialize anything. Their response to us is, well, you need to go out and hire for $3,000 a master plumber who will then file a report so we won't have liability, but they will confirm that we don't have any gas in our building. There is, after 2015, those two souls that were lost not 200 yards from our building down on East 7th Street, because we're at 31 East 7th Street at the explosion, Con Ed came in and replaced our gas pipe on the entire street. They did not even give us a feeder pipe. We have no gas cutoff valve. 29 and 31 have cutoff valves, but we have no gas yet. They're asking us to have our exposed gas internal piping inspected every four years when common sense tells you that we have no intention of ever using our building. It is vacant. It has never been apartments. It has never been anything but a union hall, a shape-up hall, and a, a gathering place. So we don't have income from things like that. We are trying to create a community space, a Yiddish theater, a teaching space for the Lower East Side, a jewel. I wish that Carolina were, Vera were still here to hear this of the good we are trying to do. So forcing us to comply with four-year uh, uh, inspections when common sense shows that we have no gas piping and when we go to the buildings department and we did speak, I'll finish with this, when we did speak with, um, uh, when we tried to speak with Commissioner LaRocca, there was no response, not that she, there was, there was none after five calls and my, my visits there, non-responsive. So what I am saying is hold us to the highest standard, prevent us from getting gas, that would be a fix. If you prevent us from getting gas, and if you had the Department of Buildings confirming we have no gas, there is no need to replace and inspect gas piping that is never going to be used because if we raise the millions required to create this community space, teaching space, Yiddish theater, and immigrant experience theater on 31 East 7th Street, we will have state-of-the-art plumbing in place. But this is a hardship, so if it goes under 22, 59 or 2321, the hardship is appreciated that you have done. It just needs a little tweak 
a little bit of benefit to help us out here. Legal counsel, I know, can do it. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a common sense speaker. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Felice Farber, Senior Director of Policy and External Affairs at the General Contractors Association of New York. Thank you, Chair Carnegie and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee for the opportunity to testify today in opposition to Intro 2278A, the City's proposal for licensing of general contractors. The GCA represents the unionized heavy civil contractors that build New York City's public works infrastructure, the roads, bridges, water and sewer systems, transit systems and parks that provide the very foundation for New York City. In general, we're not opposed to general contractor licensing requirements. We are opposed to Intro 2278A as drafted, as we believe the bill takes the wrong approach to licensing. The bill tries to fit licensing of general contractors into a specialty trade licensing model, which is not applicable to general contractor work, essentially trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The GC licensing proposal as drafted would apply to any contractor pulling a Department of Buildings permit. Such proposal would encompass city public works infrastructure contractors who may be required to pull a DOB permit for work that is ancillary to the overall project, such as a maintenance shed or sidewalk shed for a bridge or other infrastructure project. Work that is ancillary to the overall infrastructure project should be exempted from DOB general contractor licensing requirements. Contractors working on city public works projects must undergo an extensive responsibility review and background check through Vendex and the city's procurement awards process, thereby ensuring that only responsible contractors are awarded city contracts. Performance or payment bonds are also required for city procurements, ensuring that contractors doing business with the city have a base level of financial capability before they can be awarded a contract. The requirements of the GC licensing proposal are therefore not relevant to public works projects, further supporting the need to exempt public infrastructure from this proposal. The bill as drafted also is not about protecting worker, the worker's safety. Uh, may I continue or would you like me? Thank you. It's not about protecting um, or ensuring a work, uh, safe work site. If that were the case, it would establish standards of care testing, record keeping, or the like. Other GC licensing proposals across the country take this approach. Instead, the bill assigns blame to the person pulling the DOD, DOB permit without setting forth any requirements or standards relating to safety, in effect making that person the designated defendant that will allow DOB to have a photo op targeting a specific individual. By taking this approach, the bill further negatively impacts safety by driving out responsible individuals from serving as the permit designee, as no one as their right mind would accept the position to serve as the designated defendant for their company. The bill further fails to include any due process provisions. The revocation of the GC license is less to the discretion of the DOB commissioner, leaving an individual or company at risk of being put out of business at the whim of a public official. There are no steps laid out for presenting a defense or for graduated enforcement provisions. We welcome the opportunity to work in partnership with the council and the city to develop a fair and balanced proposal, but we believe that the bill um, in front of the city council today takes the wrong approach. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I, I am Donald Ranchty. I'm the executive vice president of the Building Trades Employers Association. We represent 1,100 union contractors in New York City and employing over 100,000 union workers. Uh, we're here this afternoon to um, state our opposition to intro 2278A. And just for some context, um, as I'm, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit because you've heard a lot of the points already, uh, I was the legislative director at the Department of Buildings for 11 and a half years and in the private construction sector, sector now for almost nine and have dealt with licensing of general contractors for practically 20 years. This bill isn't about safety. As, as you've heard, it's about making one person responsible for everything, which is, is, is ridiculous and there's no other word for it. Even a small contractor in New York City working in Brooklyn could have 20 or 30 jobs going at the same time. Is it right or is it safer to have one person be responsible for those 30 jobs? The DOB should be allowing multiple designees per company or requiring in some cases so that there is a person that is ultimately responsible for
for making safety decisions for those individual sites. Having one person being designated in a corporate office for a large company or a, one person in a, you know, uh, some entrepreneur working out of their garage in a small business is not the right way to say that this is about safety. It's about having one person DOB can go after. Just a quick example. One of the companies that we represent, and these pages are all filled, I'll show it to you. 200 pages of safety requirements not mandated by the city code, okay? The corporate offices of, con of general contractors in New York City, they have lawyers, they have shareholders. Some of these companies are publicly traded, and therefore they are looking at safety. The commissioner herself say, stated that the last two and a half years have been safer than the five prior. We want to work with the department. We want to make sure that they're capturing the responsible party when something goes wrong, not just someone they can walk out of an office and say, we got the bad guy, because this bill, this licensing scheme, does not at all capture the bad guy. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony. Thank you all for your testimony. Is there any questions for this panel? Thank you, we'll call uh, the final panel for today. Thank you all for your patience and for your willingness and commitment to have your testimony entered into the record. Uh, we will hear from Sean Riney, Lucy Block, Adelia Ramos de Almeida, I'm sorry, also, is uh, Joseph Condon still here? Please speak your name uh, loudly into the microphone before you begin your testimony so it can be entered into the record and you can begin when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can we get him a chair at the end? Thank you, yes. Please begin. Hi, good morning, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Joseph Condon. I'm testifying on behalf of the Community Housing Improvement Program also known as CHIP. We are true housing advocates. Our members provide rental housing to hundreds of thousands of families throughout the five boroughs. CHIP members are long-term property owners. They have good relationships with their tenants and have become part of the communities in which they provide housing. This testimony today is to call your attention to the CONH expansion bill, T2021-7888. It is a bill that was not on the original committee calendar and added late last week. The bill would greatly expand the CONH pilot program well beyond the recommendations of HPD and without any evidence of the current program being effective. We would like to call your attention to some of the negative impacts that the program has on tenants and their communities. While the program intends to root out tenant harassment, it also traps tenants into substandard building situations. Building placed on the list slowly become unoccupied as tenants move out organically and owners are unable to re-rent their units because they cannot obtain a permit to upgrade a kitchen or a bathroom or plumbing or electricity. Uh, it also acts, the program also acts as a form of redlining because banks are unwilling to lend to buildings on the CONH list. This is concerning to CHIP when looking at the communities where the CONH applies. 70% of CONH buildings are from only 11 community districts in New York City. Most of these communities are low and moderate income families or communities where housing is the number one concern but the CONH program locks tenants into bad situations because no new owner will buy a building on the CONH list. Arguably, the CONH serves to expedite neighborhood deterioration by preventing upkeep of units and forcing owners to leave housing units empty rather than re-rent them. We recently learned of a six-unit brownstone in Brooklyn where the owner is uh, part of the CONH program, uh, but it has essentially been bankrupted because five of the units are vacant they cannot be re-rented in their current condition, and the owner is stuck in the program. 
Uh, just to close out, there are numerous other concerns with the CONH program, including whether it hinders the ability of housing providers to make an apartment lead free. There are due process concerns for buildings on this, the, the list itself. And the BQI criteria used to put owners on the list is lacking. Uh, we ask the committee to um, take more time to analyze the impact of the program, whether it is effective or whether it is even necessary anymore. The world has changed significantly since 2018, in particular the passage of HSTPA, which changed the rent laws to prevent construction-related rent increases in between tenancies. Uh, thank, you for the, uh, thank you for taking this testimony. Uh, we've submitted written testimony for the record and appreciate your time at the hearing today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, please reach out to Ian Fullerton in my office as soon as possible. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Sean Riney, and I'm also here to testify in strong opposition to the expansion of the Con H pilot program. Uh, I'm a broker of apartment buildings by trade. I have no vested interest uh, in either direction. I don't own any buildings under this program, but I do have to sit in many living rooms with people that do. And it's, um, it's very hard sitting across from somebody that's worked their entire life for a building and have to tell them that it's valueless, that it cannot be sold at any price, that the conditions that they're under in terms of making repairs or you know just trying to sell or refinance the building, there's absolutely no solution for them, and you can't give a building away. The Conage program does exactly the opposite of its intention. It tries to lump in harassment with deteriorating buildings. Um, when you can't get a permit to fix something, nobody will step into it. The buildings are scarlet lettered and the tenants therefore end up staying in the exact same predicament that they're in. Uh, and I think we can all understand that when you make something valueless, that's truly what happens. It doesn't hold any value. Um, secondly, is my testimony that the, the list is completely arbitrary. It, it you know, compounds a bunch of different things and like Joseph mentioned, just needs a lot more thoughtful review. Um, is also my testimony that um, HB and City Council should really look at the intention of this because I think there is a solution that helps do the opposite and makes the repairs easier and puts it at the top of DOB's list instead of putting it on a, like I said, a five-year scarlet letter list that tells everybody that wants to invest in it, stay away, go away. Uh, thank you for hearing me out. Thank you for that testimony. That was uh, straight and to the point. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adelia de Almeida. I am, um, I live in a building on uh, 215 West 94th Street. Since 2009, there has been violations for illegal hotel in that building by the mayor's office for special enforcement. However, it doesn't stop. There's about 300 illegal hotel rooms being rented. I lived there for 26 years. I'm being harassed since the hotel thing started. I've been stonewalled by everybody that I've, at the Department of Buildings. I've been complaining lately twice a day. They've been brushing off the complaints. There was a certificate of no harassment denied in 2007. After that, they actually retaliated on the tenants that testified against them and calling police for intimidation, frivolous lawsuits, more than one, construction noise, abuse, bullying, disrespect, assault, stalking, and lack of maintenance. With COVID, things got even worse. They stopped putting homeless people in there, and drug dealers moved in, it smells all over the place, and the police is not really being helpful. They say that shelters have drugs. I've been having problems breathing since last September. I'm 65 years old and a cancer survivor. I'm an immigrant from Brazil. I used to love New York. I'm trying to pass, but the thing is to have the special enforcement to do all these buildings in New York. The complaint, they, what they told me, they have three people to enforce the laws of illegal hotels. 
in the entire city of New York. There are lots of laws. We're alone. I don't know who is going to be sleeping above me tonight. They are renting per hour. I don't know who's going to be on my side. But there'll be drug dealing, drug production, drug packaging, drug distribution. For everybody to see, I pay my own rent, and I pay in advance. Please help us. 215 West 94th Street. The Days Hotel, the owner is Sam Dong, and the manager is Sente Chatwal. He was arrested for donating money illegally to politicians in 2014. I don't know if I open my door, if there'll be drugs, drug gangs, who's gonna be outside that door? The Upper West Side is my home. I love the, the opera houses, and that's why I live in New York. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lucy Block. I'm a research and policy associate at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. Thank you, Chair Carnegie and Councilmember Kalos for sticking around um, and the opportunity to testify. Um, so ANHD coordinates the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment, or CATH NYC, and we worked with Councilmember Brad Lander in 2017 to pass the original pilot program. So we um, are in support of the bill proposing the expansion of CONH, and we um, are particularly happy to see some really important improvements and expansions to the legislation. Um, so we, uh, we did an evaluation of the pilot program uh, showing that expansion of the program was really important, that the program needed adjustments in order to have the impact that was intended of stopping tenant harassment, uh, stopping the displacement of tenants in low-income communities of color and protecting our affordable housing. We also uh, did some recent research looking at the enforcement of harassment cases generally. What we found is that out of uh, 7,126 tenant harassment cases over the last five and a half years, that at most 165 cases resulted in a favorable finding for the tenant. Uh, we found that between 1.8 and 2.3 of all tenant harassment cases resulted in a finding in favor of the tenant. Um, that's about 30 per year. So I realize my time is going out. I provided a fact sheet with a little more information on that research. Um, I wanted to emphasize some of the parts of the legislation that we think are really important, which is the expansion into districts that are um, at high risk of displacement based on the new displacement index that's being uh, created by the city after intro 1572. Um, the greatest risk of tenant harassment is in those districts where displacement risk is the greatest because landlords have the most to profit off of. Um, we also uh, think that the, the direct compensation to tenants in the legislation uh, when there's a finding of harassment by HPD is extremely important. Uh, currently in the pilot program, there's no mechanism for tenants to be compensated for harassment that they've faced in the past. So we think that those two elements are really, really important to, to maintain in the legislation. And I just want to point out that the purpose of CONH, it's linked to harassment. It doesn't prevent landlords from making repairs on buildings. It prevents them from getting permits to make improvements in order to profit more off of their buildings. But the purpose and the impact of the program is not to prevent those landlords from making necessary repairs. Thank you. Um, we submitted written testimony, and I'll be following up with some more detailed testimony. Once again, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you for the testimony we received here today from all sides. It's valuable and incredibly important as we as a city uh, really try to, make a, uh, um, uh, try to make an effort to make sure that we can protect through safety and also to make sure that um, people's homes are intact uh, through this pandemic and as we go forward. So thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we are now commencing this particular hearing, uh, housing and buildings today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben Kalos.